Welcome to Lesson 30, which goes over the start of Chapter 8 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we'll talk about files and folders and how Python can work with them. So variables are a fine way to store data when your program is running, but just like you want to save your work in a word processor program before you turn off your computer, if you want your data to persist after your program is finished, you need to save it to a file. You can think of a file's contents as a single string value. Of course, if a file is gigabytes in size, this string will be billions of characters long. But first, we have to learn a few concepts about files. Here's my desktop, which has a whole bunch of files and folders on them. Folders can contain other folders and files. So I'll just open up this marble adder file that has a whole bunch of PNG image files here. So each of these files has two key properties, a file name, which you can see right here, and a path, which is its location on the hard drive. So you can see right here, it's inside the marble adder folder, which itself is inside the desktop folder, which is inside this al folder, which is inside this users folder, which is inside this c colon folder. This altogether is called a file path. It's just the list of folders that a file is inside of. So we can go to the very top one, this c drive, and this is called the root folder. This is the folder that contains every other folder on the hard drive. So on Windows, this is going to be C colon slash, whereas on Mac and Linux, it's just going to be slash. Another thing that you'll have to pay attention to is that on Windows, there's a slash separator for all of these folder names. And it's the backslash on Windows, but on Linux and Macs, it's going to be the forward slash. Files also have a file extension, which is the last part of the file name. You can see it comes after the dot, so the extension on this file is .png, and the file extension tells you what type of file it is. So when I double click on this PNG image file, Windows knows that it should use some sort of image viewing program to display it. So let's go back to the interactive shell. We'll be using strings to represent file paths and file names. So you can see I could have some sort of fictional file path right here represented as this string. Notice, of course, in Python for Windows, since we use the backslash, the backslash character is also used for to escape uh, characters, such as a new line character will just be backslash in. And if you want to have an actual literal backslash, you need to escape the backslash itself. So if I have something like print out this string value, this is how I can print out an actual slash. So if you want slash uh, backslashes in your strings, be sure to have two backslashes, or begin the string with a lowercase r to make a raw string, which we covered in the regular expressions uh, lessons, and you, won't have, and you won't have any escape characters there. So notice I'm on Windows, so using these backslashes is the proper separation for each folder. If I have a whole bunch of names for different folders, like folder 1, folder 2, folder 3, and then some kind of file after that, I could just use the join string method to create a file path string out of all these individual folder and file names, but this code would only work on Windows, and ideally you want your Python scripts to work on all operating systems. So Python gives you this module called OS. Let's just import that right now. And the OS module contains lots of different file path related functions that we can use. One of them is os.path.join. This is a join function that is inside of a path module, which is inside of the OS module. And this just takes several string arguments and it returns the string value of a path that's appropriate for the operating system that you're running this on. So I'm on Windows, so it just uses the backslash character. If I was running this exact same code on Linux or Mac, it would be using the forward slash right here. In fact, the value that the join function uses is stored in a sep variable inside the OS module. Now, just like every file has a file path that it is located in, every program has a setting called the current working directory. Directory is just an older name for folder. The current working directory tells the program what folder it should look in when we just hand it a file name without a file path. 
you can get the current working directory as a string value with the os.getcwd, the current working directory function. So now if I just give some sort of file name to some sort of file related function and it's just spam.png without any sort of file path location information, Python will just assume, oh, I guess, well, my current working directory is this folder right here. So I'm going to assume that spam.png can be found inside there. You can also change the current working directory with the change directory function. And this is just past a new file path. So I could say, uh, change this to the root file, uh, root folder. And now when I call get CWD, it'll return this updated version. Now, if I ever use spam.png in some sort of function like delete this file, this isn't a real function, I'm just coming up with a random name. Python will assume that spam.png can be found inside of the current working directory. This is the root folder currently. So something like spam.png is an example of a relative file path. There are two kinds of file paths. There's an absolute file path, which always begins with the root folder. It gives you the complete uh, location of a program. So if this was in folder one slash folder two slash spam.png, this is an absolute file path. While a relative file path is always going to be relative to the current working directory, it's not going to begin with the root folder. So I could have something like spam.png, it's going to assume that it's sp the spam.png file that's in particular in the root folder. Now a relative file path can also begin with other folders. In this case, it's going to assume that this relative file path means it's inside of the root folder, and inside that root folder is a folder called folder1, and inside there is folder2, and then spam.png inside that folder is the file that I'm talking about. So absolute file paths always begin with the root folder, and relative file paths do not. Now there's also the dot and the dot dot folders. These aren't real folders, but special names that can be used in a relative file path. The single dot stands for this directory, or this folder, whereas two dots means the parent folder. Let me show you an example. So let's say our hard drive looked like this. Here's the C drive uh, root folder, and in there I have a folder called bacon, and a folder called eggs, and a file called spam.txt. And meanwhile, inside that bacon folder is another folder called fizz, and inside that folder is a spam.txt file. Note that this spam.txt file is a different file from this one, because they're in different locations, even though they have the same name. And let's say that my program is currently and let's say my program has its current working directory set to this folder, c slash bacon. Now, the absolute path for this is just going to be c slash bacon. In fact, all of the absolute paths you can see here begin with the root folder. But let's say I wanted to refer to other folders or files, I could also use relative paths, and those are paths that don't begin with the root folder. Instead, they usually begin with this dot, just meaning this folder. So in, if I'm currently in the c slash bacon folder with the current working directory, I could just use dot slash to refer to this folder itself if I wanted to refer to that folder. Let's say I wanted to refer to the fizz folder inside of bacon when bacon is the current working directory. I could just say, well, in this folder, which is bacon, there's another name fizz. And if I wanted to refer to the spam file inside that folder, I could say, well, this folder, there is a folder called fizz and then a file called spam.txt. But if you wanted to refer to files and folders that were above the bacon folder, like the root folder, you would need that dot dot syntax, meaning the parent folder. So current working directory is set to bacon. If I wanted to refer to the C drive with a relative file path, instead of saying this folder, I would say this parent folder. Or if I wanted to refer to, say, this spam.txt file inside of eggs here, I would have to say, well, okay, so I'm in C slash bacon for my current working directory. I want to go up to that parent folder to C slash, and then inside there is going to be eggs and spam.txt. Now for relative file paths, this dot slash at the beginning is optional. You could either use dot slash just to formally say this folder, or you could just begin it with fizz slash spam.txt, as long as it doesn't begin with the root folder name. So let's check out some more functions in the os.path module. I'm going to go ahead and change the current working directory 
back to what it was before. There's a function called os.path.absPath, and this will return a string of an absolute path of the path that you pass it. So if I pass it spam.png, this is a relative file path because it doesn't begin with the root folder. This will say, okay, you pass me spam.png, my current working directory is this folder, so the absolute file path that you're ask asking for is going to be this complete path. Or if I wanted to say, I'm talking about uh, in the parent folders, parent folder, there is a spam.png file. You will then say, okay, the absolute file path that you're talking about is this. You can see it went up from this folder and then up again from this folder. And then it said, okay, and then spam.png inside of that folder. So this is an easy way to convert a relative file path into an absolute one. There's also a function called is abs for is absolute path. And this lets you pass it any file path you want, and it'll return true if this is an absolute path. It's basically a simple way to programmatically determine if something begins with the root folder. So this is a relative file path, so it returns false. Whereas if I passed it c colon slash folder slash folder, since this begins with the root folder, is absolute path returns true. And also there's a function called rel path, which will give you the relative path between two paths that you give it. So if I said, ah, oh, well, this path folder one slash folder two slash spam.png, and let's pretend that the current working directory was just folder one, Relative path would give you a relative path from this starting path to this other path. You can see, oh, it's inside folder two, which is inside folder one. In there would be spam.png. So that's how you, this is the relative path given this current working directory that would go to this path. So it gives you the relative file path uh, from some starting point. Now let's say you had a file path that was something like this c folder one folder two slash spam.png and you just wanted to pull out say just the directory part of this or just the file name part of this there's a function called os.path.durname which will retrieve the directory part of that and there's also a function called base name which will pull out the last part, the part out of this string after the final set of slashes. And this will also work not just with file names, but it'll also pull off the last folder from that as well. So you can visualize what this is doing right here. So dir name pulls off this section of a file path, whereas base name pulls off this section right after the final slash. So all of these functions have just been nice string manipulation functions so that you don't have to write that code yourself. If you actually want to check the files on your hard drive, there's a function called uh, os.path.exists, which you can pass it a file path, and it'll return true if this file actually exists, and false if it does not. This is just some file path that I've made up, so it's going to return false. But I could also pass it c slash windows slash system32 calc, which is Windows calculator program. Whoops, forgot it's exists plural, not singular. Exists, and it would say yes, there is actually a file with this name and path. Furthermore, you could see if something like this is a folder name or a file name with the os.path.isFile function. Whereas if you just passed it the folder part, that would return false since this is just a folder, not a file. And conversely, there's also a isdir function that will tell you if a file path is for a directory that is a folder. Let's cover a couple more functions that let us examine the contents of our hard drive. There's also ofpath.getSize, which you can pass the path for a file, and it will return the size in bytes as an integer. So if I wanted to see how big that calculator program is, you can see uh, it's almost a megabyte, about 900,000 bytes. And the os.lister 
notice that this function is not inside the path module, it's just inside OS. You can pass lister the file path of a folder, and it will then return a list of strings with the file names and folder names that are inside that folder that you've passed it. So inside my automate book folder, I have all of these files and folders. So let's combine these two functions into a small program that will retrieve the size of all the files in a certain folder. This would be pretty simple. We can just have a variable called total size that starts off as zero. And then we'll just create a for loop that just iterates over the files returned by os.lister. So each of those file names that are returned in this list and remember that this list will also contain folder names as well as file names. We only want to look at the file names. So I could have some code that checks like if os.path is file. And then, well, it can't be file name because I have to provide the full path for it. So I'll just provide os.path.join automate book and then the file name. And so if this is not a file path, so I'm going to add the not boolean operator here. That's not, then, whoops, I had some syntax error here because I forgot a parenthesis. Add that parenthesis right there. So if that's not a file, then I'll just continue. Otherwise, I want to have total size be increased by the amount returned by os.path.getSize. And this will be for the absolute file name. So I'm just going to copy and paste that part. And I'll just press enter, and Python will run all of this code in this loop. And total size will be set to the size of all of the files inside this folder. So you can use code like this in a program of your own. And last, I'm just going to cover the os.makeDirs function. So if you want to create new folders, you can just pass this either a relative or an absolute file path, and it will create all the folders that you specify. So if I said, I want to create a new folder called delicious in the root folder path, but not just that, I want to create that folder and another folder inside that folder called walnut and another folder inside that folder called waffles. You could run os.makeDirs, and Python will then create all of these folders for you. So I can open up the file, the file explorer, click on C drive, and find that there's now a folder called delicious, and inside there there's a folder called walnut, and in there is a folder called waffles. And we've covered a lot of different functions in the OS and OS.path modules. Don't worry about memorizing all of them. Just remember that they exist, and you can look up the exact documentation for them later when you need it. To recap, files have a name and a path. The root folder is the lowest folder that contains all other folders. On Windows, it's C colon slash, and on Linux and Mac, it's just slash. In a file path, the folders and file names are separated by backslashes on Windows and forward slashes on Linux and Mac. Use the os.path.join function to combine folders with the correct slash for that operating system. All programs have a current working directory setting, which is a folder that any relative paths are relative to. The os.getcwd function will return the current working directory, and changeDir will change the current working directory. Absolute paths begin with the root folder, whereas relative paths do not. The dot folder represents this folder, and the dot dot folder represents the parent folder. The absolute path function will return the absolute path form of any path that you pass to it, whereas the isAbsolute function will return true if that if the path that you pass to it is an absolute path, and false if it's a relative path. rel path returns the relative path between the two paths that you pass to it. makeDirs can make folders for you, whereas os.path.getSize will return a file's size. lister will return a list of strings of file and folder names. exist will return true if a file or folder that you pass to it exists. and isFile and isDir will return true if they were passed a file or directory name. Welcome to Lesson 30, which goes over the start of Chapter 8 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we'll talk about files and folders and how Python can work with them. So variables are a fine way to store data when your program is running, but just like you want to save your work in a word processor program before you turn off your computer, 
If you want your data to persist after your program is finished, you need to save it to a file. You can think of a file's contents as a single string value. Of course, if a file is gigabytes in size, this string will be billions of characters long. But first, we have to learn a few concepts about files. Here's my desktop, which has a whole bunch of files and folders on them. Folders can contain other folders and files. So I'll just open up this marble adder file that has a whole bunch of PNG image files here. So each of these files has two key properties, a file name, which you can see right here, and a path, which is its location on the hard drive. So you can see right here, it's inside the marble adder folder, which itself is inside the desktop folder, which is inside this al folder, which is inside this users folder, which is inside this c colon folder. This altogether is called a file path. It's just the list of folders that a file is inside of. So we can go to the very top one, this C drive, and this is called the root folder. This is the folder that contains every other folder on the hard drive. So on Windows, this is going to be C colon slash, whereas on Mac and Linux, it's just going to be slash. Another thing that you'll have to pay attention to is that on Windows, there's a slash separator for all of these folder names, and it's the backslash on Windows, but on Linux and Macs, it's going to be the forward slash. Files also have a file extension, which is the last part of the file name. You can see it comes after the dot, so the extension on this file is .png, and the file extension tells you what type of file it is. So when I double-click on this PNG image file, Windows knows that it should use some sort of image viewing program to display it. So let's go back to the interactive shell. We'll be using strings to represent file paths and file names. So you can see I could have some sort of fictional file path right here represented as this string. Notice, of course, in Python for Windows, since we use the backslash, the backslash character is also used for to escape uh, characters, such as a newline character will just be backslash in. If you want to have an actual literal backslash, you need to escape the backslash itself. So if I have something like print out this string value, this is how I can print out an actual slash. So if you want slash uh, backslashes in your strings, be sure to have two backslashes, or begin the string with a lowercase r to make a raw string, which we covered in the regular expressions uh, lessons, and you won't have and you won't have any escape characters there. So notice I'm on Windows, so using these backslashes is the proper separation for each folder. If I have a whole bunch of names for different folders like folder 1, folder 2, folder 3, and then some kind of file after that, I could just use the join string method to create a file path string out of all these individual folder and file names, but this code would only work on Windows, and ideally you want your Python scripts to work on all operating systems. So Python gives you this module called OS. Let's just import that right now. And the OS module contains lots of different file path related functions that we can use. One of them is os.path.join. This is a join function that is inside of a path module which is inside of the OS module. And this just takes several string arguments and it returns the string value of a path that's appropriate for the operating system that you're running this on. So I'm on Windows, so it just uses the backslash character. If I was running this exact same code on Linux or Mac, it would be using the forward slash right here. In fact, the value that the join function uses is stored in a sep variable inside the OS module. Now just like every file has a file path that it is located in, every program has a setting called the current working directory. Directory is just an older name for folder. The current working directory tells the program what folder it should look in when we just hand it a file name without a file path. You can get the current working directory as a string value with the os.getcwd, the current working directory function. So now if I just give some sort of file name to some sort of file related function and it's just spammed up PNG without any sort of file path location information, 
Python will just assume, oh, I guess, well, my current working directory is this folder right here, so I'm going to assume that spam.png can be found inside there. You can also change the current working directory with the change directory function. And this is just past a new file path. So I could say, uh, change this to the root file, uh, root folder. And now when I call get CWD, it'll return this updated version. Now, if I ever use spam.png in some sort of function like delete this file, this isn't a real function. I'm just coming up with a random name. Python will assume that spam.png can be found inside of the current working directory. This is the root folder currently. So something like spam.png is an example of a relative file path. So there, there are two kinds of file paths. There's an absolute file path, which always begins with the root folder. It gives you the complete uh, location of a program. So if this was in folder one slash folder two slash spam.png, this is an absolute file path. While a relative file path is always going to be relative to the current working directory, it's not going to begin with the root folder. So I could have something like spam.png. It's going to assume that it's sp the spam.png file that's in particular in the root folder. Now a relative file path can also begin with other folders. In this case, it's going to assume that this relative file path means it's inside of the root folder and inside that root folder is a folder called folder one, and inside there is folder two, and then spam.png inside that folder is the file that I'm talking about. So absolute file paths always begin with the root folder, and relative file paths do not. Now there's also the dot and the dot dot folders. These aren't real folders, but special names that can be used in a relative file path. The single dot stands for this directory, or this folder, whereas two dots means the parent folder. Let me show you an example. So let's say our hard drive looked like this. Here's the C drive uh, root folder, and in there I have a folder called bacon, and a folder called eggs, and a file called spam.txt, and meanwhile inside that bacon folder is another folder called fizz, and inside that folder is a spam.txt file. Note that this spam.txt file is a different file from this one because they're in different locations, even though they have the same name. And let's say that my program is currently... And let's say my program has its current working directory set to this folder, c slash bacon. Now, the absolute path for this is just going to be c slash bacon. In fact, all of the absolute paths you can see here begin with the root folder. But let's say I wanted to refer to other folders or files, I could also use relative paths, and those are paths that don't begin with the root folder. Instead, they usually begin with this dot, just meaning this folder. So in, if I'm currently in the c slash bacon folder with the current working directory, I could just use dot slash to refer to this folder itself if I wanted to refer to that folder. Let's say I wanted to refer to the fizz folder inside of bacon, when bacon is the current working directory, I could just say, well, in this folder, which is bacon, there's another name, fizz. And if I wanted to refer to the spam file inside that folder, I could say, well, this folder, there is a folder called fizz, and then a file called spam.txt. But if you wanted to refer to files and folders that were above the bacon folder, like the root folder, you would need that dot dot syntax, meaning the parent folder. So current working directory is set to bacon. If I wanted to refer to the C drive with a relative file path, Instead of saying this folder, I would say this parent folder. Or if I wanted to refer to, say, this spam.txt file inside of eggs here, I would have to say, well, okay, so I'm in c slash bacon for my current working directory. I want to go up to that parent folder to c slash, and then inside there is going to be eggs and spam.txt. Now for relative file paths, this dot slash at the beginning is optional. You could either use dot slash just to formally say this folder, or you could just begin it with fizz slash spam.txt, as long as it doesn't begin with the root folder name. So let's check out some more functions in the os.path module. I'm going to go ahead and change the current working directory back to what it was before. There's a function called os.path.absPath. And this will return a string of an absolute path of the path that you pass it. So if I pass it spam.png, 
This is a relative file path because it doesn't begin with the root folder. This will say, okay, you passed me spam.png, my current working directory is this folder, so the absolute file path that you're ask, asking for is going to be this complete path. Or if I wanted to say, I'm talking about uh, in the parent folders, parent folder, there is a spam.png file. We'll then say, okay, the absolute file path that you're talking about is this. You can see it went up from this folder and then up again from this folder. And then it said, okay, and then spam.png inside of that folder. So this is an easy way to convert a relative file path into an absolute one. There's also a function called isabs for is absolute path. And this lets you pass it any file path you want, and it'll return true if this is an absolute path. It's basically a simple way to programmatically determine if something begins with the root folder. So this is a relative file path, so it returns false. Whereas if I passed it c colon slash folder slash folder, since this begins with the root folder, is absolute path returns true. And also there's a function called rel path which will give you the relative path between two paths that you give it. So if I said, ah, oh, well, this path folder one slash folder two slash spam.png, and let's pretend that the current working directory was just folder one, relative path would give you a relative path from this starting path to this other path. You can see, oh, it's inside folder two, which is inside folder one, in there would be spam.png. So that's how you, this is the relative path given this current working directory that would go to this path. So it gives you the relative file path uh, from some starting point. Now let's say you had a file path that was something like this, C folder one folder two slash spam.png, and you just wanted to pull out, say, just the directory part of this or just the file name part of this. There's a function called os.path.durname, which will retrieve the directory part of that. And there's also a function called base name, which will pull out the last part, the part of this string after the final set of slashes. And this will also work not just with file names, but it'll also pull off the last folder from that as well. So you can visualize what this is doing right here. So dir name pulls off this section of a file path, whereas base name pulls off this section right after the final slash. So all of these functions have just been nice string manipulation functions so that you don't have to write that code yourself. If you actually want to check the files on your hard drive, there's a function called uh, os.path.exist, which you can pass it a file path and it'll return true if this file actually exists and false if it does not. This is just some file path that I've made up so it's going to return false. But I could also pass it c slash windows slash system32 calc which is windows calculator program. Whoops, forgot it's exists plural not singular. Exists and it would say yes there is actually a file with this name and path. Furthermore, you could see if something like this is a folder name or a file name with the os.path.isfile function. Whereas if you just passed it the folder part, that would return false since this is just a folder, not a file. And conversely, there's also a isdir function that will tell you if a file path is for a directory that is a folder. Let's cover a couple more functions that let us examine the contents of our hard drive. There's also ofpath.getSize, which you can pass the path for a file, and it will return the size in bytes as an integer. So if I wanted to see how big that calculator program is, you can see uh, it's almost a megabyte, about 900,000 bytes. And the os.lister, notice that this function is not inside the path module, it's just inside os. You can pass lister the file path of a folder, and it will then return a list of strings 
with the file names and folder names that are inside that folder that you've passed it. So inside my automate book folder, I have all of these files and folders. So let's combine these two functions into a small program that will retrieve the size of all the files in a certain folder. This would be pretty simple. We can just have a variable called total size that starts off as zero. And then we'll just create a for loop that just iterates over the files returned by os.lister. So each of those file names that are returned in this list, and remember that this list will also contain folder names as well as file names. We only want to look at the file names. So I could have some code that checks like if os.path is file, and then, well, it can't be file name because I have to provide the full path for it. So I'll just provide os.path.join automate book and then the file name. And so if this is not a file path, so I'm going to add the not boolean operator here. That's not, then, whoops, I had some syntax error here because I forgot a parenthesis. Add that parenthesis right there. So if that's not a file, then I'll just continue. Otherwise, I want to have total size be increased by the amount returned by os.path.getSize. And this will be for the absolute file name. So I'm just going to copy and paste that part. And I'll just press Enter, and Python will run all of this code in this loop. And total size will be set to the size of all of the files inside this folder. So you can use code like this in a program of your own. And last, I'm just going to cover the os.makeDirs function. So if you want to create new folders, you can just pass this either a relative or an absolute file path, and it will create all the folders that you specify. So if I said I want to create a new folder called delicious in the root folder path, but not just that, I want to create that folder and another folder inside that folder called walnut, and another folder inside that folder called waffles. You could run os.makeDirs, and Python will then create all of these folders for you. So I can open up the file, the file explorer, click on C drive, and find that there's now a folder called delicious, and inside there there's a folder called walnut, and in there is a folder called waffles. We've covered a lot of different functions in the OS and OS.path modules. Don't worry about memorizing all of them. Just remember that they exist, and you can look up the exact documentation for them later when you need it. To recap, files have a name and a path. The root folder is the lowest folder that contains all other folders. On Windows, it's C colon slash, and on Linux and Mac, it's just slash. In a file path, the folders and file names are separated by backslashes on Windows and forward slashes on Linux and Mac. Use the os.path.join function to combine folders with the correct slash for that operating system. All programs have a current working directory setting, which is a folder that any relative paths are relative to. The os.getcwd function will return the current working directory, and changeDir will change the current working directory. Absolute paths begin with the root folder, whereas relative paths do not. The dot folder represents this folder, and the dot dot folder represents the parent folder. The absolute path function will return the absolute path form of any path that you pass to it, whereas the isAbsolute function will return true if, that, if the path that you pass to it is an absolute path, and false if it's a relative path. Rel path returns the relative path between the two paths that you pass to it. MakeDirs can make folders for you, whereas os.path.getSize will return a file's size. Lister will return a list of strings of file and folder names. Exist will return true if a file or folder that you pass to it exists. And isFile and isDir will return true if they were passed a file or directory name. Welcome to Lesson 31, which roughly covers pages 181 to 185 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that we know about file names and file paths, we can start writing strings to files that we create. This is a great way to save information to the hard drive. You can then later read these files, or any file on the hard drive, back into your program. This is just like saving and opening documents in an app. The type of file that we'll be reading and writing are called text or plain text files. Plain text files only contain basic text characters, and they don't include any information about font or size or color. 
uh, text files usually have the .txt file extension. Now, Python scripts are an example of plain text files, except they also have the .py file extension. Plain text files can be opened with programs like Windows's Notepad or OS X's text edit application. For example, I'll just open up one of my plain text Python files with Notepad. And these files just have the plain text information. They don't have anything else like a word processor would have with fonts or centering text or anything else like that. It's just text. Just like a Python string is just text. Now the other type of files besides plain text files are called binary files, and these are every other type of, of file. Uh, word processing documents, PDFs, images, spreadsheets, executable programs. If you open a binary file in Notepad, like I'll open up Windows's calculator program, calc.exe, you're going to find that it's going to be impossible to understand. And since every different type of binary file has to be handled in its own way, this book really won't go into reading and writing raw binary files directly. Most of the time there are modules to handle these binary file formats for you anyway, and we'll be going into them in future lessons in this course. And there are three steps to reading or writing files in Python. First, you're going to call the open function, and you'll pass it a file name that you'd like to open. So I would like to open users slash al slash hello.txt. In fact, let's go ahead and use notepad to create this file. So on OS X, you can use text edit or some other plain text file editor program. You can create this file right here and then save it to your user accounts home folder. On Windows, this is going to be something like c slash users slash al. And I'll just save this as hello.txt. If you're on OS X, your users folder is going to be slash users slash whatever your account name is. And then you can save hello.txt there. So this function call will open the file in plain text read mode. We'll just call this read mode for short. When a file is open in read mode, Python lets you only read data from the file. You can't write or modify it in any way. Read mode is the default mode for files you open in Python with this open function. And the call to open returns a file object. So we're going to save that to hello file. So the file data type has several methods, including one is the read method. And this will return a string of the entire plain text file's contents. Let's just copy and paste this and run it in the interactive shell. Hello file.read, and that returns the contents of that file that we just typed. You can notice that the new line character is represented as slash in. And after we're done reading the file contents, we'll call the close method to close that file. Now we can only read through the file contents once. If we want to read it again, we'll have to call open again. So we should probably save this to a variable. Let's just say content. Alternatively, there's also a read lines method for file objects. And this will return all of the lines as strings inside of a list. So this is just a different way of, of getting the file contents in a structure that you want. Read lines will return a list of strings whereas read will simply just return a single string. And Python allows you to write content to files in a similar way that how the print function writes strings to the screen. You can't write to a file that you've opened in read mode though. Instead, you'll have to open it in write mode or append mode. So write mode will overwrite an existing file and start from scratch with a blank text file, just like when you overwrite a variable's value with a new value. To open in write mode, pass the string w to the open function as the second argument. Append mode, on the other hand, will append the text that you're writing to the end of an existing file. So you can think of this as like appending to a list in a variable rather than overwriting the variable altogether. To open it in append mode, you'll just pass a lowercase a as the second argument to the open function. Now in both cases, if this file doesn't already exist, Python will just create a new blank text file for you to write to. So I'm just going to create a file hello2 
and open it in write mode. And in order to write strings to this file, I'll call the write method and pass it a string that I want to write to it. And write will return the integer of how many bytes of how many characters it wrote to it. And generally you'll just ignore this information. So I can call this multiple times and finally close that file. So I'll use notepad to go ahead and open this hello2.txt file. And you'll notice that the write method doesn't automatically add a new line character to the end of each string that we passed it, the way that the print function does when it prints things to a string, uh, prints things to the screen. So if we want new lines, we're going to have to add them ourselves to the end of the strings that we pass, like this, slash in for the new line character. Let's just have another example. Uh, let's say bacon file. And let's just say bacon.txt. We'll open this in write mode. We'll just write the string. Bacon is not a vegetable. And then we'll close that. Now this is a relative file path, so you might be wondering where on my hard drive is this actually? Well, if you remember from last lesson, you can import the OS module. And the OS module has a function called get current working directory. So Python is just going to use this file path relative to the current working directory. So here is where we're going to find that bacon.txt file. Let's print this out so it's easier to copy to the clipboard. Control C to copy, file open, and paste it here. You can see here in this folder is where that bacon.txt file is. And just as an example, I'll open this file now in append mode so that it doesn't overwrite the contents that are already there. And I'll just write some more text. I'll add a new line, maybe a couple new lines. And I'll just add some text. Uh, bacon is delicious. And I'll just have to reopen this file. And you can see there were two new line characters added along with bacon is delicious. And in append mode, the original contents of the file weren't erased. Now writing and reading text files is a good way to store a single long string, but if you want to store variables that have lists and dictionaries and other complex data structures, you can save variables in your Python programs to binary shelf files using the shelve module. So I'll give you an example. Let's just import the shelve module, and then we'll call shelve.open, and we'll just say this file is going to be called myData, and this will return a shelf file object. I'll just store that in a variable called shelf file. And you can make changes to the shelf value as if it were a dictionary. And when you're done, just call, call close on the shelf value. So for example, I could say shelf file, and let's have a key called cats. And in this, I'll just store a list of my cat names. Zofi, Buka, Simon, Fat Tail. Cleo. I actually don't have this many cats. And then I'll call shelffile.close. And then later when I run this progr my program again in the future, I could just have code that reopens that shelf file. And I can grab the value just like a dictionary. In fact, if you think about it, variables inside of Python programs are kind of like key value pairs in a dictionary. If I had a variable called cats, and I saved this string to it, you can consider this cat's variable to sort of be the key and this list to be the value. And so that's why it has a dictionary-like structure for this. You can see here we just have a keys, the string cats, and then the value of whatever we want to store. And the benefit of using the shelf module is that you can store things like lists and dictionaries and non-text data to a file and then reopen them in the future with your Python program. Now you might be wondering, what does this actually look like on your hard drive? So let's go back to the current working directory folder, 
where I originally had this my data. I'll just open up the file explorer here. And you see on Windows, this actually creates three new files where all this data is stored. MyData.dir, MyData.dat, MyData.back. On OS X and Linux, I believe that there's only one file that's created, MyData.db. But these are the files where this information for the shelf is all stored. And these are binary files. So if you open this in Notepad, they would also have this weird sort of binary file format. You can kind of see the data here, and really you could just open this file as a plain text file to read this as a string, but it would be hard to figure out, oh, I guess this means the beginning of a list value, and this means like that comma and stuff. It's better just to let the shelf module handle all these details for you. So shelf file objects are very similar to dictionaries. In fact, they even have a keys and values method that will return list-like values for all the keys and values inside them. So let's just convert this to an actual list value. So here are all the keys inside that shelf module, or inside that shelf file. And then we can also call its values method as well. So if you just need to store plain text, you can open up a program using the open function and then just use write or read or read lines to write and read the text to, uh, to these files as strings. But if you want to store complex data like lists and dictionaries, or if you just want to store strings but use this sort of dictionary format, you can use a shelf file in the shelf module. To recap, open will return a file object which has reading and writing related methods. You can pass the string r, or more commonly nothing, as the second argument to open to open the file in read mode, or pass the string w for write mode or the string a for append mode. Opening a non-existent file in write or append mode will create uh, that file. It'll just create a blank file that you'll start writing to. You can call the read or write methods on a file object to read the contents of the file or write a string to that file, or you could call the read lines method to return a list of strings of the file's content, and then call close after you're done with the file. Meanwhile, there's also a shelf module that Python can use to store Python data structures like lists and dictionaries into a binary file, and you can get a shelf a file object by calling shelf.open to return it this dictionary-like shelf value. Welcome to lesson 31, which roughly covers pages 181 to 185 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that we know about file names and file paths, we can start writing strings to files that we create. This is a great way to save information to the hard drive. You can then later read these files, or any file on the hard drive, back into your program. This is just like saving and opening documents in an app. The type of file that we'll be reading and writing are called text or plain text files. Plain text files only contain basic text characters and they don't include any information about font or size or color. Uh, text files usually have the .txt file extension. Now, Python scripts are an example of plain text files, except they also have the .py file extension. Plain text files can be opened with programs like Windows's Notepad or OS X's text edit application. For example, I'll just open up one of my plain text Python files with Notepad. These files just have the plain text information. They don't have anything else like a word processor would have with fonts or centering text or anything else like that. It's just text. Just like a Python string is just text. Now the other type of files besides plain text files are called binary files, and these are every other type of, of file. Uh, word processing documents, PDFs, images, spreadsheets, executable programs, if you open a binary file in Notepad, like I'll open up Windows's calculator program, calc.exe, you're going to find that it's going to be impossible to understand. And since every different type of binary file has to be handled in its own way, this book really won't go into reading and writing raw binary files directly. Most of the time there are modules to handle these binary file formats for you anyway, and we'll be going into them in future lessons in this course. And there are three steps to reading or writing files in Python. First, you're going to call the open function. You'll pass it a file name 
that you'd like to open. So I would like to open users slash al slash hello.txt. In fact, let's go ahead and use notepad to create this file. So on OS 10, you can use text edit or some other plain text file editor program. You can create this file right here and then save it to your user accounts home folder. On Windows, this is going to be something like c slash users slash al. And I'll just save this as hello.txt. If you're on OS 10, your users folder is going to be slash users slash whatever your account name is. And then you can save hello.txt there. So this function call will open the file in plain text read mode. We'll just call this read mode for short. When a file is open in read mode, Python lets you only read data from the file. You can't write or modify it in any way. Read mode is the default mode for files you open in Python with this open function. And the call to open returns a file object. So we're gonna save that to hello file. So the file data type has several methods, including one is the read method. And this will return a string of the entire plain text file's contents. Let's just copy and paste this and run it in the interactive shell. Hello file.read, and that returns the contents of that file that we just typed. You can notice that the new line character is represented as slash in. And after we're done reading the file contents, we'll call the close method to close that file. Now we can only read through the file contents once. If we want to read it again, we'll have to call open again. So we should probably save this to a variable. Let's just say content. Alternatively, there's also a read lines method for file objects. And this will return all of the lines as strings inside of a list. So this is just a different way of, of getting the file contents in a structure that you want. Read lines will return a list of strings, whereas read will simply just return a single string. And Python allows you to write content to files in a similar way that how the print function writes strings to the screen. You can't write to a file that you've opened in read mode though. Instead, you'll have to open it in write mode or append mode. So write mode will overwrite an existing file and start from scratch with a blank text file, just like when you overwrite a variable's value with a new value. To open in write mode, pass the string w to the open function as the second argument. Append mode, on the other hand, will append the text that you're writing to the end of an existing file. So you can think of this as like appending to a list in a variable rather than overwriting the variable altogether. To open it in append mode, you'll just pass a lowercase a as the second argument to the open function. Now in both cases, if this file doesn't already exist, Python will just create a new blank text file for you to write to. So I'm just going to create a file hello2 and open it in write mode. And in order to write strings to this file, I'll call the write method and pass it a string that I want to write to it. And write will return the integer of how many bytes of how many characters it wrote to it. And generally you'll just ignore this information. So I can call this multiple times and finally close that file. So I'll use notepad to go ahead and open this hello2.txt file. And you'll notice that the write method doesn't automatically add a new line character to the end of each string that we passed it, the way that the print function does when it prints things to a string, uh, prints things to the screen. So if we want new lines, we're going to have to add them ourselves to the end of the strings that we pass, like this, slash in for the new line character. Let's just have another example. Uh, let's say bacon file. And let's just say bacon.txt. We'll open this in write mode. We'll just write the string. Bacon is not a vegetable. And then we'll close that. Now this is a relative file path, so you might be wondering, where on my hard drive is this actually? Well, if you remember from last lesson, 
we can import the OS module. And the OS module has a function called get current working directory. So Python is just going to use this file path relative to the current working directory. So here is where we're going to find that bacon.txt file. Let's print this out so it's easier to copy to the clipboard. Control C to copy, file open, and paste it here. You can see here in this folder is where that bacon.txt file is. And just as an example, I'll open this file now in append mode so that it doesn't overwrite the contents that are already there. And I'll just write some more text. I'll add a new line, maybe a couple new lines. And I'll just add some text. Uh, bacon is delicious. And I'll just have to reopen this file. You can see there were two new line characters added along with bacon is delicious. And in append mode, the original contents of the file weren't erased. Now writing and reading text files is a good way to store a single long string. But if you want to store variables that have lists and dictionaries and other complex data structures, you can save variables in your Python programs to binary shelf files using the shelve module. So I'll give you an example. Let's just import the shelve module, and then we'll call shelve.open, and we'll just say this file is going to be called myData, and this will return a shelf file object. I'll just store that in a variable called shelf file. And you can make changes to the shelf value as if it were a dictionary, and when you're done, just call, call close on the shelf value. So for example, I can say shelf file, and let's have a key called cats. And in this, I'll just store a list of my cat names. Zophie, Puka, Simon, Fattail, Cleo. I actually don't have this many cats. And then I'll call shelffile.close. And then later when I run this prog my program again in the future, I could just have code that reopens that shelf file and I can grab the value just like a dictionary. In fact, if you think about it, variables inside of Python programs are kind of like key value pairs in a dictionary. If I had a variable called cats and I saved this string to it, you can consider this cats variable to sort of be the key and this list to be the value. And so that's why it has a dictionary-like structure for this. You can see here we just have a keys, the string cats, and then the value of whatever we want to store. And the benefit of using the shelf module is that you can store things like lists and dictionaries and non-text data to a file and then reopen them in the future with your Python program. Now you might be wondering, what does this actually look like on your hard drive? So let's go back to the current working directory folder where I originally had this my data. I'll just open up the file explorer here. And you see on Windows, this actually creates three new files where all this data is stored. MyData.dir, MyData.dat, MyData.back. On OS X and Linux, I believe that there's only one file that's created, MyData.db. But these are the files where this information for the shelf is all stored. And these are binary files. So if you open this in Notepad, They would also have this weird sort of binary file format. You can kind of see the data here, and really you could just open this file as a plain text file to read this as a string, but it would be hard to figure out, oh, I guess this means the beginning of a list value, and this means like the comma and stuff. It's better just to let the shelf module handle all these details for you. So shelf file objects are very similar to dictionaries. In fact, they even have a keys and values method that will return list-like values for all the keys and values inside them. So let's just convert this to an actual list value. So here are all the keys inside that shelf module, or inside that shelf file. And then we can also call its values method as well. 
So if you just need to store plain text, you can open up a program using the open function and then just use write or read or read lines to write and read the text to, uh, to these files as strings. But if you want to store complex data like lists and dictionaries, or if you just want to store strings but use this sort of dictionary format, you can use a shelf file in the shelve module. To recap, open will return a file object which has reading and writing related methods. You can pass the string r, or more commonly nothing, as the second argument to open to open the file in read mode, or pass the string w for write mode or the string a for append mode. Opening a non-existent file in write or append mode will create uh, that file. It'll just create a blank file that you'll start writing to. You can call the read or write methods on a file object to read the contents of the file or write a string to that file, or you could call the read lines method to return a list of strings of the file's content, and then call close after you're done with the file. Meanwhile, there's also a shelve module that Python can use to store Python data structures like lists and dictionaries into a binary file, and you can get a shelf a file object by calling shelve.open to return it this dictionary-like shelf value. Welcome to lesson 32, which roughly covers pages 197 to 200 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In the previous lesson, you learned how to create and write to new files in Python. Your programs can also organize pre-existing files on the hard drive. Maybe you've had the experience of going through a folder full of dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of files and having to copy, rename, or move them all by hand. All of that boring stuff is just begging to be automated by Python. And the shutil, or shell utilities module, has functions that let you copy, move, rename, and delete files in your Python programs. So to use the shutil functions, first we'll have to import shutil. The first function we'll look at is the copy function. This will just copy a file to a new folder. So we can type shutil.copy and then specify one file, Let's say I have spam.txt right here inside the root folder. So it's c colon slash spam.txt and say I wanted to copy it to c colon slash delicious. I'll just pass the destination of where I want it to go. This will be in delicious. And when I execute this function, it will return the string of the copied files location. That's just a side effect. Usually we'll just ignore that. You can see that now there is a copy of spam.txt inside the delicious folder. Now you can also do a copy and rename at the same time by specifying a file name for the destination. So say I wanted to copy it to the delicious folder, but also rename it to spam spam spam.txt. You can see now it's copied that file, but also given it a name spam spam spam.txt. So the copy function will work for copying a single file, but what if you wanted to copy an entire folder full of its own folders and files? You could use shutil.copyTree and then just specify a folder. So I'm going to say, I'm going to uh, specify the delicious folder and all of the files and folders inside of it. And I want to copy it as a new folder called delicious backup. So now if we go back to the root folder, you can see there's a new folder called delicious backup and it has the same contents as the original delicious folder. Now let's say we wanted to move a file to a new location. Just move it to a different folder. shutil has a move function, and the first string will be the file that you want to move. So say I wanted to move spam.txt to delicious slash, there's a walnut folder inside of that delicious folder. So now this file no longer exists at this location. Instead, it's been moved to this folder. You can see it's new file path and name right here. We can go to the walnut folder here and we can see this spam file is right here. Now if you want to do a rename, there is no rename function in shutil. Instead, what you do is you use the move function and let's find that 
spam.txt file, and you rather you move it to the same folder that it's already in, but with a new name. This is kind of like what we did right here when we copied a file but also gave it a new name. Here we'll just move this file, except its destination folder is going to be the same one as before, and we'll just uh, save it with a new name as well. So technically we're just moving it to the same folder but with a new name, and this has the effect of just renaming this file. So you can see in delicious slash walnut that spam.txt file has now been renamed to eggs.txt using the move function. So to recap, shutil.copy will copy a file, copy tree will copy a folder and all its content, and move can move a file but also rename it as well. Welcome to lesson 32, which roughly covers pages 197 to 200 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In the previous lesson, you learned how to create and write to new files in Python. Your programs can also organize pre-existing files on the hard drive. Maybe you've had the experience of going through a folder full of dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of files and having to copy, rename, or move them all by hand. All of that boring stuff is just begging to be automated by Python. And the shutil, or shell utilities module, has functions that let you copy, move, rename, and delete files in your Python programs. So to use the shutil functions, first we'll have to import shutil. The first function we'll look at is the copy function. This will just copy a file to a new folder. So we can type shutil.copy and then specify one file, let's say I have spam.txt right here inside the root folder, so it's c colon slash spam.txt, and say I wanted to copy it to c colon slash delicious. I'll just pass the destination of where I want it to go. This will be in delicious, and when I execute this function, it will return the string of the copied file's location. That's just a side effect, usually we'll just ignore that. You can see that now, there is a copy of spam.txt inside the delicious folder. Now you can also do a copy and rename at the same time by specifying a file name for the destination. So say I wanted to copy it to the delicious folder, but also rename it to spam spam spam.txt. You can see now it's copied that file, but also given it a name spam spam spam.txt. So the copy function will work for copying a single file, but what if you wanted to copy an entire folder full of its own folders and files? You could use shutil.copyTree and then just specify a folder. So I'm going to say, I'm going to uh, specify the delicious folder and all of the files and folders inside of it, and I want to copy it as a new folder called delicious backup. So now if we go back to the root folder, you can see there's a new folder called delicious backup and it has the same contents as the original delicious folder. Now let's say we wanted to move a file to a new location. Just move it to a different folder. shutil has a move function and the first string will be the file that you want to move. So say I wanted to move spam.txt to delicious slash there's a walnut folder inside of that delicious folder. So now this file no longer exists at this location. Instead it's been moved to this folder. You can see its new file path and name right here. We can go to the walnut folder here and we can see this spam file is right here. Now if you want to do a rename, there is no rename function in shutil. Instead, what you do is you use the move function, and let's find that spam.txt file, and you rather you move it to the same folder that it's already in, but with a new name. This is kind of like what we did right here when we copied a file but also gave it a new name. Here we'll just move this file, except its destination folder is going to be the same one as before, 
and we'll just uh, save it with a new name as well. So technically we're just moving it to the same folder but with a new name and this has the effect of just renaming this file. So you can see in delicious slash walnut that spam.txt file has now been renamed to eggs.txt using the move function. So to recap, shutil.copy will copy a file, copy tree will copy a folder and all its content, and move can move a file but also rename it as well. Welcome to lesson 33, which roughly covers pages 200 to 202 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So if you want to delete files and folders, there are three functions you can use. One of them is in the OS module. It's os.unlink, which is kind of an old name for delete. And this one you would just pass it some file name. And this will permanently delete this file. Now I'm passing it a relative file path hit right here. This is a file that doesn't begin with the root folder. If you want to know which bacon.txt exactly it's deleting, you can call the getcwd function to get the current working directory. So you can figure out, oh, okay, if I delete, if I unlink bacon.txt, it will actually delete the bacon.txt that's inside this folder. So unlink will delete a single file. You can also delete a folder with the os.remove directory, that's rmdir function, and then you can remove some direct, some file or some folder that you pass it. So uh, if I wanted to remove the delicious folder that I have. Now one thing that you have to keep in mind when calling rmdir is that the folder has to be completely empty. It can't have any files or folders inside of it. So if I try to delete this right now, I'll get an error saying, oh, this is not empty. And that's just kind of a nice safeguard in case you to keep you from deleting a folder that has a ton of files and folders in it. Now if you do want to remove a folder and all of its content, you'll have to import the sh, the shell utilities module. And shell utilities has a remove tree. This is kind of like the delete analog of copy tree. Instead of copying a folder and all its contents, this will delete a folder and all of its content. So if I pass it that delicious folder name, I'll just scroll down here in my file explorer. So my delicious folder has all of this, all of these files and folders inside of it. If I run this code, rmtree will delete that entire folder and everything in it. So you want to be really careful with these functions because these will permanently delete these files and folders. They won't send them to the recycling bin. So one way that you can be really careful with this is by doing a dry run of any code that has these deleting functions in them. So let's say I have a program like this. It imports OS and it iterates over all of the files and folders inside the current working directory that's returned by list dir. And I want to find any of those file names that ends with, and let's say I wanted to delete .txt files, but I made a typo instead and said .rxt files. But I keep writing the rest of my program and I just say, oh, I wanted to delete all of those txt files here, not realizing that I had made this typo. So a dry run is when you just comment out any of the code that would actually delete files or do any of these uh, file operations, and instead just have a print function call to print out that file name. And let's go ahead and just change the current working directory to be my desktop. So lister here will just return a list of strings of all the files and folders in the current working directory, which I just set to desktop. And I'll just save this as example.py. So since I've commented out this code, I don't have anything to be worried about as far as deleting all the files. I can run this program and it will print out all the file names of the things that I thought I would normally be deleting. So I could just check this and I realize, oh wait, there's this important file that's .rxt. 
That's this file right here, that's on my desktop that I was going to delete. That's not really what I intended, so instead, I'll go back to my program, realize my mistake, and then correct it. Then I can run this dry run just one more time, and I can say, oh yeah, this switching to python.txt file, that's the one I wanted to delete. So I could just comment out this line and uncomment this line to actually run this program and delete this file. But really, using these deleting functions, unlink, remove directory, remove tree, those are all kind of dangerous to use anyway, because all of those deletions will be permanent. So there's a module called send to trash that instead of deleting it permanently, will just send it to your operating system's recycling bin. So send to trash doesn't come with Python, you'll have to install it yourself using the pip uh, installer. And there's instructions in the course notes for how to do this for your operating system, since it's different for each operating system. But I'll just show you on Windows, you can open up a command line prompt uh, and change directories to program files, Python, scripts, and run pip.exe install send to trash. And here I've already installed it, so it just says, oh, that's already installed. But that's how you can just install third-party modules using pip on Windows. So once that's installed, I can just import send to trash, and send to trash has a function also called send to trash, and that'll allow you to delete any files that you, or folders that you pass it, but instead of deleting them permanently, just deletes, uh, just sends them to the recycling bin. So let's take that important file .rxt that I had right here on the desktop. You can then pass it something like users al desktop important file dot rxt and you can see that deleted the file but not permanently I can just open up my recycling bin and say oh this is that file that I needed so I could just either permanently delete it here or just restore it back to its original location so to recap os.unlink will delete a file, os.remove directory will delete a folder, but the folder has to be empty, shutil.remove tree will delete a folder and all its contents, all the files and folders inside it, so that's kind of dangerous. So what you first want to do is do a dry run where you comment out all of the calls to these delete functions and just have a print function call instead so that you can run the program and see what exactly it's going to do first. And it's probably just better to install the send to trash module and use its send to trash function to delete files and folders by sending them to the recycling bin instead of deleting them permanently. Welcome to lesson 33, which roughly covers pages 200 to 202 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So if you want to delete files and folders, there are three functions you can use. One of them is in the OS module. It's os.unlink which is kind of an old name for delete. And this one you would just pass it some file name. And this will permanently delete this file. Now I'm passing it a relative file path hit right here. This is a file that doesn't begin with the root folder. If you want to know which bacon.txt exactly it's deleting, you can call the getcwd function to get the current working directory. So you can figure out, oh, okay, if I delete if I unlink bacon.txt, it will actually delete the bacon.txt that's inside this folder. So unlink will delete a single file. You can also delete a folder with the os.remove directory, that's rmdir function, and then you can remove some direct some file or some folder that you pass it. So uh, if I wanted to remove the delicious folder that I have. Now one thing that you have to keep in mind when calling rmdir is that the folder has to be completely empty. It can't have any files or folders inside of it. So if I try to delete this right now, I'll get an error saying, oh, this is not empty. And that's just kind of a nice safeguard in case you, to keep you from deleting a folder that has a ton of files and folders in it. Now if you do want to remove a folder and all of its content, you'll have to import the sh, the shell utilities module. And shell utilities has a remove tree. This is kind of like the re delete analog of copy tree. Instead of copying a folder and all its contents, this will delete a folder and all of its content. 
So if I pass it that delicious folder name, I'll just scroll down here in my file explorer. So my delicious folder has all of this, all of these files and folders inside of it. If I run this code, RMTree will delete that entire folder and everything in it. So you want to be really careful with these functions because these will permanently delete these files and folders. They won't send them to the recycling bin. So one way that you can be really careful with this is by doing a dry run of any code that has these deleting functions in them. So let's say I have a program like this. It imports OS and it iterates over all of the files and folders inside the current working directory that's returned by listdir. And I want to find any of those file names that ends with, and let's say I wanted to delete .txt files, but I made a typo instead and said .rxt files, but I keep writing the rest of my program and I just say, oh, I wanted to delete all of those txt files here, not realizing that I had made this typo. So a dry run is when you just comment out any of the code that would actually delete files or do any of these uh, file operations, and instead just have a print function call to print out that file name. And let's go ahead and just change the current working directory to be my desktop. So lister here will just return a list of strings of all the files and folders in the current working directory, which I just set to desktop. And I'll just save this as example.py. So since I've commented out this code, I don't have anything to be worried about as far as deleting all the files. I can run this program and it will print out all the file names of the things that I thought I would normally be deleting. So I could just check this and I realize, oh wait, there's this important file that's .rxt. That's this file right here that's on my desktop that I was going to delete. That's not really what I intended, so instead I'll go back to my program, realize my mistake, and then correct it. Then I can run this dry run just one more time and I can say, oh yeah, this switching to python.txt file, that's the one I wanted to delete. So then I could just comment out this line and uncomment this line to actually run this program and delete this file. But really, using these deleting functions, unlink, remove directory, remove tree, those are all kind of dangerous to use anyway because all of those deletions will be permanent. So there's a module called send to trash that instead of deleting it permanently, will just send it to your operating system's recycling bin. So send to trash doesn't come with Python. You'll have to install it yourself using the pip uh, installer. And there's instructions in the course notes for how to do this for your operating system since it's different for each operating system. But I'll just show you on Windows, you can open up a command line prompt, uh, and change directories to program files, Python, scripts, and run pip.exe install send to trash. And here I've already installed it, so it just says, oh, that's already installed. But that's how you can just install third-party modules using pip on Windows. So once that's installed, I can just import send to trash, and send to trash has a function also called send to trash. And that'll allow you to delete any files that you, or folders that you pass it, but instead of deleting them permanently, just deletes, uh, just sends them to the recycling bin. So let's take that important file .rxt that I had right here on the desktop. You can then pass it something like users al desktop important file .rxt. And you can see that deleted the file, but not permanently. I can just open up my recycling bin and say, oh, this is that file that I needed. So I could just either permanently delete it here or just restore it back to its original location. So to recap, os.unlink will delete a file. os.remove directory will delete a folder, but the folder has to be empty. Shutil.remove tree will delete a folder and all its contents, all the files and folders inside it. So that's kind of dangerous. So what you first want to do is do a dry run where you comment out all of the calls to these delete functions 
and just have a print function call instead so that you can run the program and see what exactly it's going to do first. And it's probably just better to install the send to trash module and use its send to trash function to delete files and folders by sending them to the recycling bin instead of deleting them permanently. Welcome to lesson 34. I have a folder on my hard drive called delicious. It's right here in the root folder. And delicious has some more content inside of it. It has other folders and files like this foo folder or walnut folder. It has a file named spam.txt and another one called spam spam spam.txt. And if we go into that walnut folder, you can see it also has a folder and has an eggs.txt file and inside that waffles folder is some other files. Say I wanted to write some code that would apply to all of the folders and files inside of this delicious folder. Basically what I want to do is walk through this folder tree and either rename or copy or do something with all of these files in that code. Writing a program to do this could get tricky, but fortunately Python provides a function to handle this process for you. It's called the os.walk function. So first let's import the os module, and os.walk is past a root folder that you want to check. So in this case, I want to look at the delicious folder and all the folders and files underneath it. Now the return value for this is used in for loops. I'll just say for right there, and it actually, instead of just returning one value, like what the range function does, so instead of having something like for i in range, it actually returns three values on each iteration of this loop. So the three values, you can name, this is just a regular for loop, so you can name the variables whatever you want, but I like to go with these names. The first one I call folder name, because the first val of the three values will be a string with the folder name that it's currently looking at on this iteration. And then it also provides a list of all the folders inside that folder, so I'm just going to say uh, the variable subfolders can contain that list. And then it also contains a list of strings for all the files inside this folder. This is kind of like what the os.listdir function returns. It's a list of file names. So I can create this for loop, and I'll just have a colon right here. And on each iteration of this loop, it'll go through all the folders underneath this delicious folder. And on each iteration, it also provides all the folders that are in that folder and all the files that are in that folder. So let me just write up some code just so that you can see what exactly is happening here. I'm going to have a a lot of print functions here just to display all this data. So I'm going to say the folder is, and we'll just append the folder name. So on this iteration, this will just print out whatever the folder it's currently looking at is. And then also subfolders is a list. So we could just say print the subfolders in folder name are and then I'll just print out uh, this list value. I'll have to convert that to a string first so that we can concatenate it. And we can do the same thing here with the file names list. That's also a list. I'll just say, and the file names inside that folder name are this. And then just have a blank print call just to print out a new line. So now when I press enter, this is going to walk through the entire Full, uh, the entire directory tree or folder tree underneath delicious. So here's the output from this for loop. So here's the first iteration. On that iteration, it's just looking at the delicious folder itself, and it's also, so folder name has been set to c slash delicious, and the subfolders list is a list of all the folder names inside that folder, and File names is a list of all the files inside that folder. But then here's the great thing. On the next iteration of this os.walk, we're going to examine all of the folders underneath this delicious folder. So first we're going to take a look at delicious slash foo, and it'll tell us all the folders and file names there. And then it'll take a look at delicious slash walnut, and it'll tell us all the folders and file names in that folder. And then it'll go, keep diving deeper and deeper, now looking at delicious slash walnut slash waffles, and it'll tell us all the folders 
and file names there. So I'm just going to copy this out uh, and create a new file editor. So we have code like this. So on each iteration, it's easy to add code that would uh, loop over this list of folder names. We just say for subfolder in subfolders. Then we could print out the subfolder name, or we could do whatever we need to do, uh, do with it. We could have code that, say, deletes this subfolder. If we wanted to go through and delete all of the folders underneath delicious, or if we wanted to rename it, but only under some specific circumstance, like if the string fish was in the subfolder name, like we had a whole bunch of folders and some of them had the name fish in them and we wanted to delete all of the fish folders in here, we could then say, okay, in that case, then delete uh, remove directory subfolder. And we could do the same thing with all the files in the file names list. So for file in file names, you know, so if this uh, file uh, ended with some certain extension, like if we want to delete all the Python uh, source files there, or maybe we just wanted to copy them somewhere else, we could then have like a copy function and just add the, and then add the old name, and then, you know, maybe we wanted to rename it so that it had a new extension like dot .backup or something like this. This is kind of tricky because remember, this is just a string of the file name. It's not an absolute path, so we'd have to call the os.join to join the folder name and that file. So say we wanted to rename it to have dot .backup at the end of it. But using code like this allows us to do a lot of, of small decision making on a lot of files, thousands of files or folders. That's really wouldn't be possible to do with the file explorer. Like, you know, it's really easy for me to say, oh, I want to just delete the entire delicious folder. So I could just highlight all of this and then right click and select delete. But say I wanted to, you know, find all of those, say all of these sub these folders that had the name fish in them and just delete those then that's there's no way to just massively do that i'd have to click through every single folder underneath the delicious directory and for this in this case that wouldn't be that much but say i had a folder with thousands of files and thousands of folders in it that would take up a lot of time so do it using this os.walk fold uh, function allows us to write code where we can perform some sort of action or run some code against all of the folders or file names underneath a certain folder. And if I wanted to do this for all of the files on my computer, which probably isn't recommended, I could just put in the root folder name. This really isn't recommended. I should probably do a dry run first by commenting out this code and uh, printing something like, you know, oh, I'm removing this directory. Same thing here, where I can just print out a message saying I'm copying this file to this new file name. But there's a lot of functionality that you can use in os.walk. Just remember, you'll use os.walk's return value in a for loop, and that returns three different values on each iteration. The folder name of the current folder it's looking at, all of the subfolders, a list of strings for the subfolders inside this folder, and also a list of strings for the file names inside that folder. Welcome to lesson 34. I have a folder on my hard drive called delicious. It's right here in the root folder. And delicious has some more content inside of it. It has other folders and files like this foo folder or walnut folder, it has a file named spam.txt and another one called spam spam spam.txt. And if we go into that walnut folder. You can see it also has a folder and has an eggs.txt file and inside that waffles folder some other files. Say I wanted to write some code that would apply to all of the folders and files inside of this delicious folder. Basically what I want to do is walk through this folder tree and either rename or copy or do something with all of these files in that code. 
Writing a program to do this could get tricky, but fortunately Python provides a function to handle this process for you. It's called the os.walk function. So first let's import the os module, and os.walk is past a root folder that you want to check. So in this case, I want to look at the delicious folder and all the folders and files underneath it. Now the return value for this is used in for loops. I'll just say for right there, and it actually, instead of just returning one value, like what the range function does, so instead of having something like for i in range, it actually returns three values on each iteration of this loop. So the three values, you can name, this is just a regular for loop, so you can name the variables whatever you want, but I like to go with these names. The first one I call folder name, because the first val of the three values will be a string with the folder name that it's currently looking at on this iteration. And then it also provides a list of all the folders inside that folder, so I'm just going to say uh, the variable subfolders can contain that list. And then it also contains a list of strings for all the files inside this folder. This is kind of like what the os.listdir function returns. It's a list of file names. So I can create this for loop, and I'll just have a colon right here. And on each iteration of this loop, it'll go through all the folders underneath this delicious folder. And on each iteration, it also provides all the folders that are in that folder and all the files that are in that folder. So let me just write up some code just so that you can see what exactly is happening here. I'm going to have a a lot of print functions here just to display all this data. So I'm going to say the folder is, and we'll just append the folder name. So on this iteration, this will just print out whatever the folder it's currently looking at is. And then also subfolders is a list. So we could just say print the subfolders in folder name are and then I'll just print out uh, this list value. I'll have to convert that to a string first so that we can concatenate it. And we can do the same thing here with the file names list. That's also a list. I'll just say, and the file names inside that folder name are this. And then just have a blank print call just to print out a new line. So now when I press enter, this is going to walk through the entire Full, uh, the entire directory tree, or folder tree, underneath delicious. So here's the output from this for loop. So here's the first iteration. On that iteration, it's just looking at the delicious folder itself, and it's also, so folder name has been set to c slash delicious, and the subfolders list is a list of all the folder names inside that folder, and file names is a list of all the files inside that folder. But then here's the great thing. On the next iteration of this os.walk, we're going to examine all of the folders underneath this delicious folder. So first we're going to take a look at delicious slash foo, and it'll tell us all the folders and file names there. And then it'll take a look at delicious slash walnut, and it'll tell us all the folders and file names in that folder. And then it'll go, keep diving deeper and deeper, now looking at delicious slash walnut slash waffles, and it'll tell us all the folders and file names there. So I'm just going to copy this out uh, and create a new file editor. So we have code like this. So on each iteration, it's easy to add code that would uh, loop over this list of folder names. We just say for subfolder in subfolders. Now we could print out the subfolder name, or we could do whatever we need to do, uh, do with it. We could have code that, say, deletes this subfolder if we wanted to go through and delete all of the folders underneath delicious, or if we wanted to rename it, but only under some specific circumstance, like if the string fish was in the subfolder name. Like we had a whole bunch of folders and some of them had the name fish in them and we wanted to delete all of the fish folders in here. We could then say, okay, in that case, then delete uh, remove directory subfolder. And we could do the same thing with all the files in the file names list. So for file in file names, you know, so if this uh, file uh, 
ended with some certain extension, like if we want to delete all the Python uh, source files there, or maybe we just wanted to copy them somewhere else, we could then have like a copy function and just add the, and then add the old name, and then you know maybe we wanted to rename it so that it had a new extension like dot backup or something like this. This is kind of tricky because remember, this is just a string of the file name. It's not an absolute path, so we'd have to call the os.join to join the folder name and that file. So say we wanted to rename it to have dot backup at the end of it. But using code like this allows us to do a lot of, of small decision making on a lot of files, thousands of files or folders. That really wouldn't be possible to do with the file explorer. Like, you know, it's really easy for me to say, oh, I want to just delete the entire delicious folder. So I could just highlight all of this and then right click and select delete. But say I wanted to, you know, find all of those, say all of these sub these folders that had the name fish in them and just delete those then that's there's no way to just massively do that i'd have to click through every single folder underneath the delicious directory and for this in this case that wouldn't be that much but say i had a folder with thousands of files and thousands of folders in it that would take up a lot of time so do it using this os.walk uh, function allows us to write code where we can perform some sort of action or run some code against all of the folders or file names underneath a certain folder. And if I wanted to do this for all of the files on my computer, which probably isn't recommended, I could just put in the root folder name. This really isn't recommended. I should probably do a dry run first by commenting out this code and uh, printing something like, you know, oh, I'm removing this directory. Same thing here, where I can just print out a message saying I'm copying this file to this new file name. But there's a lot of functionality that you can use in os.walk. Just remember, you'll use os.walk's return value in a for loop, and that returns three different values on each iteration. The folder name of the current folder it's looking at, all of the subfolders, a list of strings for the subfolders inside this folder, and also a list of strings for the file names inside that folder. Welcome to lesson 35, which roughly covers pages 215 to 221 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that you know enough to write more complicated programs, you might start finding not so simple bugs in them. The next few lessons cover some tools and techniques for finding the root cause of bugs in your program to help you fix your bugs faster and with less effort. Your computer will only do what you tell it to do. It won't read your mind and do what you intended it to do. Even professional programmers create bugs all the time. All the time. <laughs> so don't feel discouraged if your program has a problem. And Python raises an exception whenever it tries to execute invalid code. For example, a zero divide error happens when we try to divide a number by zero. And this doesn't make mathematical sense, so Python raises an exception. In previous lessons, you learned how to handle Python's exceptions with try and accept statements so that your program can recover from exceptions that you anticipated. But you can also raise your own exceptions in your code. Raising an exception is a way of saying, stop running this code in this function and move the program execution to the accept statement. Uh, exceptions are raised with a raise statement. So that's just the raise keyword, and then we'll call the exception function passing it a string for an error message. And this will return an exception object that is raised. And the effect of this is the exact same as the other exceptions that were raised, except this is your own custom message that you can add to it. So if there are no try and accept statements covering the raise statement, the program simply crashes and displays the exceptions error message. So let's do an example. Open up a new file editor window, and let's say we wanted to create a box printing function. So this would be a function that just prints out a box of characters that you supply it with. So say I wanted to create a kind of a longish box 
that looked something like this. Something that's just five lines tall and what is this? Probably about 15 or so wide. But not just this size, but any size box. So I want to create a function that we can pass it a symbol, just like the, the asterisk string in this box. Uh, and then we can also pass it an integer for the width and height. And when we call this box print function, it'll print out a box that looks like this. So this code is pretty simple. So first we need to print out the top line of that. So we'll just call print and we want to print out the symbol. We will use string replication with the asterisk operator to replicate this by width. And then we need to print out all these sides right here. We'll need to print out several of them. So let's create a loop for i in range. And well, actually it won't be height because it'll be height minus two because we don't want to count this line and this line. We just want to print out these and the top and bottom row will be included in the height. So let's loop over height minus two. So this will print each line. So again, we'll just print out symbol, but then we'll also need to print out a certain number of spaces. So I'm just gonna have a white space character and use string replication, multiply it by the height, and then have symbol on the right side as well, right here, except just like this was height minus two, we also want this to be width minus two. And then after that, we need to print the bottom line. So we'll just print out this again. So we can test this out. Let's call box print. Let's say I want to do asterisks and I want it to be about 15 characters wide and five characters tall. I'll just save this as example.py and press F5 to run it. Yeah, that's pretty nice. I can do this with lots of different things. I could say, uh, we'll just use a capital O instead, and I want to make a really tall and skinny box, so five characters wide and 16 characters tall. So that's nice. Here's the first one, and then here's the second one. So this function is working out pretty well. No bugs in it that we can see, except what if sometimes we accidentally pass it a string that has more than one character in it. Like what if I pass it with two asterisks there? What happens then? Well, then we can see that actually this starts messing up. Now, clearly this is a bug. Our program hasn't crashed or anything, but it's not working the way that we want it to work. So instead, we could just detect these situations. You know, what happens if the length of symbol is not one? And then we could raise an exception to handle that. So I could have code that says if length of symbol does not equal one, in that case, we'll raise a new exception and we'll pass it a helpful error message. Something like uh, symbol needs to be a string of length one. So now when we run this program, still with this bad symbol value that we're passing it, it now raises an exception and it gives us the error message. So this tells us, oh, there's something wrong with our code. And it's good that we're detecting it now. It's better to fail fast and early, so that way the program doesn't keep running and then it becomes harder to trace back the original cause of this bug. So there's a bunch of other things that we could check also, like say if we create a one by one box, that would actually kinda look a little bit weird and unexpected. We could add code to handle this case, or we could just say, well, when you call box print, the width and height have to be two or greater. So if width is less than two or height is less than two, and we'll just raise another exception. Width and height must be greater or equal to two. So that'll raise an exception when we pass it a width or height of one. So this entire error message is called a traceback. You can see it has the error message and also the kind of error right here, but it also has a whole bunch of other information as well. For one, it gives us a traceback, also called a call stack, and that shows you sort of the lines that were called before getting to the line that caused the error. So here at the bottom, you can see that line 16 inside the 
box print is what raised the exception. Here's that line of code. So you can see right here, this is line 16. This is where we rose this code, but how did we get to this code? Well, this box print function was called here on line 25, and that's being told to us right here. So this is very useful if you have a function that's called from multiple places, and you want to figure out from where it was called this one time when it caused this exception to be raised. That'll help you trace where the original cause of this bug is. Now you can get this text as a string value with the traceback.formatexception function. So this is inside the traceback module, so we'll have to import that module first. And let's just have some example code. Let's just have a try. And all this does is just raises an exception. This is the error message. I just need some generic exception being raised. Then we can have an accept. Let's say this was in a, some program and we didn't want the exception to cause the program to crash or stop. We just wanted to write this exception text to some sort of log file and then keep the program running. So we could have something like error file equals, we'll just open up a new file called error log. We'll open this up in append mode so it just adds this content to the existing content in this file. And then error file dot write, get the string from the format exception function, and then just close this. And then maybe also just have a print message to, to display this to the user. Traceback info was written to error log dot txt. When we run this code, this is going to enter a try block and then just raise this exception. And we've specified this code for the exception. So you can see this is from that print statement. And now if I go to, what is the uh, current working directory? Oh, okay. So this error log.txt file will be inside the current working directory because I just passed it a relative file path here. So I'm just going to copy this and then hit Windows R. And I'll just open this in the file explorer. And you see right here, there's an error log.txt file. I can open this up in a, in a text editor. So this is kind of nice. And even if we run this, pro, uh, this code multiple times, you can see because we have run it using append mode, all this log text just gets written to that file. So even if we had multiple errors happening, we wouldn't lose any of them. We'd always have a permanent record here in this text file. Next, let's cover assertions. An assertion is a sanity check that makes sure your code isn't doing something obviously wrong. These sanity checks are performed by assert statements. If the sanity check fails, then an assertion error exception is raised. So the assert statement is simply just the assert keyword followed by a condition. And if this condition evaluates to false, then it raises the, asserts, uh, the assertion error. And we can specify uh, an error message as well. This is the error message. So you can see this condition will always evaluate to false since it's just the false value. And it basically looks like this. Assertion error is just another kind of exception. Let's have an example. I'm gonna open up a new file editor window and let's say we were creating some sort of simple traffic simulator program. And in this program, we have uh, intersections with stoplights. I'm gonna say this variable market in second will represent the stoplights at the intersection of Market and Second Street. We'll just have a simple data structure for this stoplight. We'll just say in the north-south direction, the stoplight is green, and in the east-west direction, the stoplight is red. So we can change the values in this dictionary data structure to reflect whatever the current state of that stoplight is. So I could later change this to yellow or red or whatever. And now let's say for as part of our program, we wanted to create a function that will switch the lights. What happens when a light switch happens? We want it to modify these data structures. So let's just say, um, we'll just pass it intersection and this intersection parameter will basically just be a, a data structure like we have here in markets in second. So later here, we're gonna just call this switch lights 
function and then pass it some dictionary data structure like market in second. So okay, let's think about what happens here. Um, let's have a for loop for key in intersection dot keys because we want to run the same switching uh, light switching code on the north south key and also the east west key. So we'll just have a loop and key will be, the key variable will be set to either the string north south or the string east west. And the code would look something like this. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Let's say um, if the intersection key, so if key was set to north south, this would be the this would be the green string. So let's say, you know, if that's set to green, then what we want to do is set it to the light that comes after green, which is yellow. And then if that light, oh, else if that light was yellow, we want to set it to red. And if the intersection light for either north, south, or east, west was set to red, we would want to set it to green. Now this code seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, fairly simple. Let's just save this as example.py. And then you write the rest of your traffic simulation program. But when you actually start running it, all these virtual cars in the program keep crashing into each other and you don't know why. If you're just looking at this code right now, you might not even see the bug that's right here. Here, I'll show you what it is. We can just say uh, print out market in second. And then when we call switch lights, let's print out what market in second looks like afterwards. You can see right now it's a green light in the north-south direction and a red light in the east-west direction. But now when I run this, you can see, okay, first time, yeah, green and red, that's fine and green lights are turned to yellow lights, and red lights are turned to green lights. So the program hasn't crashed or anything, but let's think about this. There's traffic going in the north-south direction and the east-west direction. Obviously what we want to have happen is this should turn to yellow, but red doesn't turn to green until that yellow has turned to red. This is a pretty subtle bug. We didn't pick up on it, but we could have if while we were writing this, we just call an assert statement and just have some function that has to be true, a sanity check that as a condition that evaluates to true. And if it doesn't, there is obviously something wrong. So let's say the string red has to be in the values of stoplight. And if not, we want to raise an assertion error. And the error message that we'll pass is neither light is red. And we can just print out, and we can just print out the uh, dictionary data structure as well. So now, if we had written this when we had, when we had first started, we will immediately find out, oh, there is a problem in the switch lights code. Oh, whoops. Mistype this. So now when we run this code, we can see that there is some sort of error. It's telling us neither light is red, and it's also showing us what that data structure is. And we can see, oh, right, that's going to be a problem when we run this traffic simulator program if there is traffic going in both directions. So in plain English, an assert statement is saying, I assert that this condition always holds true. And if not, there is clearly a bug somewhere in the program. Unlike exceptions, your code shouldn't handle assert statements with try and accept. If the assert fails, your program should crash. And by failing fast like this, you shorten the time between the original cause of the bug and when you first notice the bug. This will reduce the amount of code that you have to check before figuring out what is causing the bug. Now assertions are for programmer errors, not user errors. For errors that can be recovered from, such as a file is not found, or a user entered invalid data, or something that can be expected, raise an exception instead of detecting it with an assert statement. Now the exact circumstances of when you should use an assert statement or when you should use a raise statement to raise an exception uh, is up for debate. But as long as you're doing something to detect error states in your program, that will really help you by letting you find out about errors sooner rather than later. You can also use assertions with an assert statement. And assertions are for detecting programmer errors that are not meant to be recovered from. 
That's why we often say assertions are sanity checks. We never expect them to actually be, uh, be raised. However, user errors should raise exceptions. Welcome to Lesson 35, which roughly covers pages 215 to 221 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that you know enough to write more complicated programs, you might start finding not-so-simple bugs in them. The next few lessons cover some tools and techniques for finding the root cause of bugs in your program to help you fix your bugs faster and with less effort. Your computer will only do what you tell it to do. It won't read your mind and do what you intended it to do. Even professional programmers create bugs all the time. All the time. <laughs> so don't feel discouraged if your program has a problem. And Python raises an exception whenever it tries to execute invalid code. For example, a zero divide error happens when we try to divide a number by zero. And this doesn't make mathematical sense, so Python raises an exception. In previous lessons, you learned how to handle Python's exceptions with try and accept statements so that your program can recover from exceptions that you anticipated. But you can also raise your own exceptions in your code. Raising an exception is a way of saying, stop running this code in this function and move the program execution to the accept statement. Uh, exceptions are raised with a raise statement. So that's just the raise keyword, and then we'll call the exception function passing it a string for an error message, and this will return an exception object that is raised. And the effect of this is the exact same as the other exceptions that were raised, except this is your own custom message that you can add to it. So if there are no try and accept statements covering the raise statement, the program simply crashes and displays the exception's error message. So let's do an example. Open up a new file editor window, and let's say we wanted to create a box printing function. So this would be a function that just prints out a box of characters that you supply it with. So say I wanted to create a kind of a longish box that looked something like this. Something that's just five lines tall and what is this? Probably about 15 or so wide. But not just this size, but any size box. So I want to create a function that we can pass it a symbol, just like the, the asterisk string in this box. Uh, and then we can also pass it an integer for the width and height. And when we call this box print function, it'll print out a box that looks like this. So this code is pretty simple. So first we need to print out the top line of that. So we'll just call print and we want to print out the symbol we will use string replication with the asterisk operator to replicate this by width. And then we need to print out all the sides right here. We'll need to print out several of them. So let's create a loop for i in range. And well, actually, it won't be height because it'll be height minus 2 because we don't want to count this line and this line. We just want to print out these and the top and bottom row will be included in the height. So let's loop over height minus two, so this will print each line. So again, we'll just print out symbol, but then we'll also need to print out a certain number of spaces. So I'm just gonna have a white space character and use string replication, multiply it by the height, and then have symbol on the right side as well, right here, except just like this was height minus 2, we also want this to be width minus 2. And then after that we need to print the bottom line, so we'll just print out this again. So we can test this out. Let's call box print. Let's say I want to do asterisks, and I want it to be about 15 characters wide and 5 characters tall. I'll just save this as example.py and press F5 to run it. Hey, that's pretty nice. I can do this with lots of different things. I could say, uh, we'll just use a capital O instead, and I want to make a really tall and skinny box, so five characters wide and 16 characters tall. So that's nice. Here's the first one, and then here's the second one. So this function is working out pretty well. No bugs in it that we can see, except what if sometimes we accidentally pass it a string that has more than one character in it. Like, what if I pass it with two asterisks there? 
what happens then? Well, then we can see that actually this starts messing up. Now, clearly this is a bug. Our program hasn't crashed or anything, but it's not working the way that we want it to work. So instead, we could just detect these situations, you know, what happens if the length of symbol is not one, and then we could raise an exception to handle that. So I could have code that says if length of symbol does not equal one, in that case, we'll raise a new exception and we'll pass it a helpful error message, something like uh, symbol needs to be a string of length one. So now when we run this program, still with this bad symbol value that we're passing it, it now raises an exception and it gives us the error message. So this tells us, oh, there's something wrong with our code and it's good that we're detecting it now. It's better to fail fast and early so that way the program doesn't keep running and then it becomes harder to trace back the original cause of this bug. So there's a bunch of other things that we could check also, like say if we create a one by one box, that would actually kind of look a little bit weird and unexpected. We could add code to handle this case, or we could just say, well, when you call box print, the width and height have to be two or greater. So if width is less than two or height is less than two, and we'll just raise another exception. Width and height must be greater or equal to two. So that'll raise an exception when we pass it a width or height of one. So this entire error message is called a traceback. You can see it has the error message and also the kind of error right here, but it also has a whole bunch of other information as well. For one, it gives us a traceback, also called a call stack, and that shows you sort of the lines that were called before getting to the line that caused the error. So here at the bottom, you can see that line 16 inside the box print is what raised the exception. Here's that line of code. So you can see right here, this is line 16. This is where we rose this code, but how did we get to this code? Well, this box print function was called here on line 25, and that's being told to us right here. So this is very useful if you have a function that's called from multiple places, and you want to figure out from where it was called this one time when it caused this exception to be raised. That'll help you trace where the original cause of this bug is. Now you can get this text as a string value with the traceback dot format exception function. So this is inside the traceback module, so we'll have to import that module first. And let's just have some example code. Let's just have a try. And all this does is just raises an exception. This is the error message. I just need some generic exception being raised. Then we can have an accept. Let's say this was in a, some program and we didn't want the exception to cause the program to crash or stop. We just wanted to write this exception text to some sort of log file and then keep the program running. So we could have something like error file equals, we'll just open up a new file called error log. We'll open this up in append mode so it just adds this content to the existing content in this file. And then error file dot write, get the string from the format exception function. And then just close this. And then maybe also just have a print message just to display this to the user. Case back info was written to error log txt. When we run this code, this is going to enter a try block and then just raise this exception. And we've specified this code for the exception. So you can see this is from that print statement. And now if I go to what is the uh, current working directory? Oh, okay. So this error log.txt file will be inside the current working directory because I just passed it a relative file path here. So I'm just going to copy this and then hit Windows R. And I'll just open this in the file explorer. And you see right here, there's an error log.txt file. I can open this up in a, in a text editor. So this is kind of nice. 
And even if we run this, uh, this code multiple times, you can see because we have run it using append mode, all this log text just gets written to that file. So even if we had multiple errors happening, we wouldn't lose any of them. We would always have a permanent record here in this text file. Next, let's cover assertions. An assertion is a sanity check that makes sure your code isn't doing something obviously wrong. These sanity checks are performed by assert statements. If the sanity check fails, then an assertion error exception is raised. So the assert statement is simply just the assert keyword followed by a condition. And if this condition evaluates to false, then it raises the, assert, uh, the assertion error. And we can specify uh, an error message as well. This is the error message. So you can see this condition will always evaluate to false since it's just the false value. And it basically looks like this. Assertion error is just another kind of exception. Let's have an example. I'm going to open up a new file editor window, and let's say we were creating some sort of simple traffic simulator program. And in this program, we have uh, intersections with stoplights. I'm going to say this variable market and second will represent the stoplights at the intersection of market and second street. We'll just have a simple data structure for this stoplight. We'll just say in the north-south direction, the stoplight is green, and in the east-west direction, the stoplight is red. So we can change the values in this dictionary data structure to reflect whatever the current state of that stoplight is. So I could later change this to yellow or red or whatever. And now let's say for as part of our program, we wanted to create a function that will switch the lights. What happens when a light switch happens? We want it to modify these data structures. So let's just say um, We'll just pass it intersection, and this intersection parameter will basically just be a, a data structure like we have here in markets in second. So later here, we're going to just call this switch lights function and then pass it some dictionary data structure like market in second. So, okay, let's think about what happens here. Um, let's have a for loop for key in intersection dot keys. Because we want to run the same switching uh, light switching code on the north-south key and also the east-west key. So we'll just have a loop and key will be, the key variable will be set to either the string north-south or the string east-west. And the code would look something like this. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Let's say um, if the intersection key, so if key was set to north-south, this would be the this would be the green string. So let's say, you know, if that's set to green, then what we want to do is set it to the light that comes after green, which is yellow. And then if that light, oh, else if that light was yellow, we want to set it to red. And if the intersection light for either north, south, or east, west was set to red, we would want to set it to green. Now this code seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, fairly simple. Let's just save this as example.py. And then you write the rest of your traffic simulation program. But when you actually start running it, all these virtual cars in the program keep crashing into each other and you don't know why, if you're just looking at this code right now, you might not even see the bug that's right here. Here, I'll show you what it is. We can just say uh, print out market in second, and then when we call switch lights, let's print out what market in second looks like afterwards. You can see right now, it's a green light in the north-south direction and a red light in the east-west direction. But now when I run this, you can see, okay, first time, yeah, green and red, that's fine and green lights are turned to yellow lights, and red lights are turned to green lights. So the program hasn't crashed or anything, but let's think about this. There's traffic going in the north-south direction and the east-west direction. Obviously what we want to have happen is this should turn to yellow, but red doesn't turn to green until that yellow has turned to red. This is a pretty subtle bug. We didn't pick up on it, but we could have if while we were writing this, we just call an assert statement 
and just have some function that has to be true, a sanity check that as a condition that evaluates to true. And if it doesn't, there is obviously something wrong. So let's say the string red has to be in the values of stoplight. And if not, we want to raise an assertion error. And the error message that we'll pass is neither light is red. And we can just print out, and we can just print out the uh, dictionary data structure as well. So now, if we had written this when we, when we had first started, we will immediately find out, oh, there's a problem in the switch lights code. Oh, whoops, mistyped this. So now when we run this code, we can see that there's some sort of error. It's telling us neither light is red, and it's also showing us what that data structure is. And we can see, oh, right, that's going to be a problem when we run this traffic simulator program if there is traffic going in both directions. So in plain English, an assert statement is saying, I assert that this condition always holds true. And if not, there is clearly a bug somewhere in the program. Unlike exceptions, your code shouldn't handle assert statements with try and accept. If the assert fails, your program should crash. And by failing fast like this, you shorten the time between the original cause of the bug and when you first notice the bug. This will reduce the amount of code that you have to check before figuring out what is causing the bug. Now, assertions are for programmer errors, not user errors. For errors that can be recovered from, such as a file is not found, or a user entered invalid data, or something that can be expected, raise an exception instead of detecting it with an assert statement. Now, the exact circumstances of when you should use an assert statement or when you should use a raise statement to raise an exception uh, is up for debate. But as long as you're doing something to detect error states in your program, that will really help you by letting you find out about errors sooner rather than later. You can also use assertions with an assert statement. And assertions are for detecting programmer errors that are not meant to be recovered from. That's why we often say assertions are sanity checks. We never expect them to actually be, uh, be raised. However, user errors should raise exceptions. Welcome to Lesson 36, which roughly covers pages 221 to 225 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. If you've ever put a print function call in your code to output some variable's value while your program is running, you've used some form of logging to debug your code. Logging is a great way to understand what's happening in your program and in what order it's happening. Python's logging module makes it easy to create a record of custom messages that you write. To enable the logging module to display log messages on your screen as your program runs, put the following at the top somewhere at the beginning of your program. First, you'll import the logging module, and then you'll call the logging module's basic config function and pass it the level keyword equals logging.debug, and the format keyword, you pass it a string percent ask time s percent level name s and percent message s you don't need to worry too much about how this works just know that this is the setup code for logging in python so let's do an example with a function that calculates factorial in mathematics factorial 4 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 or 24 and factorial 7 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7, or 5040. Let's write a function that will calculate factorials for us. Open a new file editor window and enter the following code. It has a bug in it, and we'll later use log messages to help us figure out this bug and where it's going wrong. So let's create a function factorial that has a parameter in. We'll start a total variable at 1 then just loop over a range of integers from 0 to n plus 1, so that way it includes 1. We'll just have total multiplied by i, and then after that loop, we'll just return total. Now let's just print out an example. A factorial of 5 will be printed to the screen. I'll just save this as example.py, and then press F5 to run it. And it turns out here the factorial of 5 is 0. That doesn't seem right. There must be some kind of bug in this program. And we can use log messages to get an idea of what's going on 
at each step in this program. So in order to do this, we'll have to import the logging module. We'll have to call that basic config function. I'll just copy and paste that here. And then we can start adding log messages with the debug function and pass it some string for each message. So I'll say start a program right here. Uh, maybe at the end, just have end of program. And here I'll just say uh, start of factorial. And I'll use string formatting here that we put in inside of there. Uh, and maybe another one on each iteration of this loop. We'll have logging.debug, just say i is set to here, and total is percent %s. And let's put i for that first percent %s, and total for that next percent %s. And then at the very end of the function, I'll just say return value is percent %s. That'll be total. So now when we run this function, each of these debug function calls are kind of like print function calls, except there's a lot more information that they give. For one, they provide us with a timestamp of when exactly this is happening. And then also right here is the debug log level. And this is because we called the debug function. Log levels will be explained in a little bit. And then the message that we passed it as a string is given right here. So we can see at the very start, i is set to zero, and so total is zero. But then when i is set to one, total is still zero. When i is set to two, the total is still zero. So something is obviously happening right here. And if we look at our code, we can realize, oh, okay, well, we started total at one because we wanted to have one times one, and then uh, that total times two, and then total times three, and so on. But what we're doing is multiplying it by zero on the very first iteration because this range function is starting at zero, and really we want it to start at one. Now, before when we ran this without the logging messages, we just got the return value as zero, so we had no idea where this was going wrong. And it's kind of really subtle that we forget, oh right, range begins at zero if you just provide it with one argument. But in the two argument form, we can also give the starting integer as well as the stopping integer. So let's save this and run this now. And we can see that it returns 120. So these debug function calls are pretty much the exact same thing as print. You know, the timestamp that they add is kind of nice, but why don't we just have, you know, print instead? We were using that before, why can't we just keep adding that? Well, one thing you'll notice is this is a lot of text that's spitting out, and this text is really helpful when we're trying to debug our program or when we're writing our program, but we eventually want to take all of this out. Now, if we had been doing this with print function calls, we basically have to find all of these print function calls and then just select them and then delete them or maybe just comment them out. But there's a problem with that in that sometimes we actually want a print function call. Like right here, we wouldn't want to accidentally delete this thinking it was some sort of debug message. But if we use the debug function in the logging module, there's a really simple way that we can just turn off all of these logging messages. That's just by calling logging uh, here at the top just call logging.disable and pass it logging.critical. So now when we run this program, that disables all the log messages. So this is kind of nice. If we ever want them back, we can just comment this out and then run the program again. So logging.debug and logging.critical are called log levels. And there are five log levels. Debug, the lowest level, info, warning, error, and critical. Now the names aren't really that important. Just realize that there's five levels going from the lowest to the highest. And when you call logging.debug, you're creating a log message at the debug level. There's also a logging.info, logging.warning, logging.error, and also logging.critical. Each of these prints a log message at a different log level. And what this logging.disable does is it says, okay, I want you to disable all log messages at the critical level or lower. And since critical is the highest level, this disables all of them. Now in your program, you can call the, the different logging functions based on the priority of that message. So say this message wasn't really that important at all, we could just leave it at logging.debug. Debug is the lowest level. But say this was really important, uh, or more important, we could just call it at info, 
which is a slightly higher level. Now sometimes you might have messages that would indicate a warning, which it means something could possibly go wrong, or error, meaning that something has gone wrong, or even that critical level, which means that not only has something gone wrong, but it's also something that will should cause the program to stop immediately. If you want to hide all of the debug messages, but you want to keep all of the info, warning, and error, and critical logging messages, you can just disable the debug level and below. Or you could, say, disable the warning level messages and below. Passing critical will, in effect, disable all the logging messages. And ultimately, it's up to you whether or not you decide a message for the, a logging message is important enough to be at debug or critical or warning or whatever. Now, instead of displaying the log messages to the screen, you can also write them to a text file. If you want to write all of these log messages to a file, just change this basic config call and add file name equals, and just type the file name that you want it to write to. I'm going to say myprogramlog.txt. This is a relative path name, so this will just be written to this file name in the current working directory. So now, when I run the program, instead of being displayed to the screen, all of the logging messages are saved to this file. So I'm going to run this, and none of the logging messages appeared on the screen. But if I open up the file explorer, I'll see that my program log.txt has been created, and that has all of the log messages I need. To recap, the logging module lets you display logging messages. The log messages create a breadcrumb trail of what your program is doing. After calling basic config to set up logging, call logging.debug to create a log message. And when you're done, you can disable the log messages by calling logging.disable and passing logging.critical to it. So don't use print for log messages. They're really hard to remove when you're done debugging. The five log levels are debug, the lowest, info, warning, error, and critical. You can also log to a file instead of the screen with the file name keyword argument to the basic config function. Welcome to lesson 36, which roughly covers pages 221 to 225 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. If you've ever put a print function call in your code to output some variable's value while your program is running, you've used some form of logging to debug your code. Logging is a great way to understand what's happening in your program and in what order it's happening. Python's logging module makes it easy to create a record of custom messages that you write. To enable the logging module to display log messages on your screen as your program runs, put the following at the top somewhere at the beginning of your program. First, you'll import the logging module, and then you'll call the logging module's basic config function and pass it the level keyword equals logging.debug and the format keyword you pass it a string percent ask time s percent level name s and percent message s you don't need to worry too much about how this works. Just know that this is the setup code for logging in Python. So let's do an example with a function that calculates factorial. In mathematics, factorial 4 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, or 24. And factorial 7 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7, or 5040. Let's write a function that will calculate factorials for us. Open a new file editor window and enter the following code. It has a bug in it, and we'll later use log messages to help us figure out this bug and where it's going wrong. So let's create a function factorial that has a parameter in. We'll start a total variable at 1, then just loop over a range of integers from 0 to n plus 1, so that way it includes 1. We'll just have total multiplied by i, and then after that loop, we'll just return total. Now let's just print out an example. A factorial of 5 will be printed to the screen. I'll just save this as example.py, and then press F5 to run it. And it turns out here the factorial of 5 is 0. That doesn't seem right. There must be some kind of bug in this program. And we can use log messages to get an idea of what's going on at each step in this program. So in order to do this, we'll have to import the logging module, 
we'll have to call that basic config function. I'll just copy and paste that here. And then we can start adding log messages with the debug function and pass it some string for each message. So I'll just say start a program right here. Uh, maybe at the end, just have end of program. And here I'll just say uh, start of factorial. And I'll use string formatting here that we put in inside of there. Uh, and maybe another one on each iteration of this loop. We'll have logging.debug. Just say i is set to here and total is percent %s. And let's put i for that first percent %s and total for that next percent %s. And then at the very end of the function, I'll just say return value is percent %s. That'll be total. So now when we run this function, each of these debug function calls are kind of like print function calls, except there's a lot more information that they give. For one, they provide us with a timestamp of when exactly this is happening. And then also right here is the debug log level. And this is because we called the debug function. Log levels will be explained in a little bit. And then the message that we passed it as a string is given right here. So we can see at the very start, i is set to zero, and so total is zero. But then when i is set to one, total is still zero. When i is set to two, but total is still zero. So something is obviously happening right here. And if we look at our code, we can realize, oh, okay, well, we started total at one because we wanted to have one times one, and then uh, that total times two, and then total times three, and so on. But what we're doing is multiplying it by zero on the very first iteration because this range function is starting at zero, and really we want it to start at one. Now, before when we ran this without the logging messages, we just got the return value as zero, so we had no idea where this was going wrong. And it's kind of really subtle that we forget, oh right, range begins at zero if you just provide it with one argument. But in the two argument form, we can also give the starting integer as well as the stopping integer. So let's save this and run this now. And we can see that it returns 120. So these debug function calls are pretty much the exact same thing as print. You know, the timestamp that they add is kind of nice, but why don't we just have, you know, print instead? We were using that before. Why can't we just keep adding that? Well, one thing you'll notice is this is a lot of text that's spitting out. And this text is really helpful when we're trying to debug our program or when we're writing our program. But we eventually want to take all of this out. Now, if we had been doing this with print function calls, we basically have to find all of these print function calls and then just select them and then delete them or maybe just comment them out. But there's a problem with that in that sometimes we actually want a print function call. Like right here, we wouldn't want to accidentally delete this thinking it was some sort of debug message. But if we use the debug function in the logging module, there's a really simple way that we can just turn off all of these logging messages. That's just by calling logging uh, here at the top. Just call logging.disable and pass it logging.critical. So now when we run this program, that disables all the log messages. So this is kind of nice. If we ever want them back, we can just comment this out and then run the program again. So logging.debug and logging.critical are called log levels. And there are five log levels, debug, the lowest level, info, warning, error, and critical. Now the names aren't really that important. Just realize that there's five levels going from the lowest to the highest. And when you call logging.debug, you're creating a log message at the debug level. There's also a logging.info, logging.warning, logging.error, and also logging.critical. Each of these prints a log message at a different log level. And what this logging.disable does is it says, okay, I want you to disable all log messages at the critical level or lower. And since critical is the highest level, this disables all of them. Now in your program, you can call the, the different logging functions based on the priority of that message. So say this message wasn't really that important at all, we could just leave it at logging.debug. Debug is the lowest level. But say this was really important, uh, or more important, we could just call it at info, which is a slightly higher level. Now sometimes you might have messages that would indicate a warning, 
which it means something could possibly go wrong, or error, meaning that something has gone wrong, or even that critical level, which means that not only has something gone wrong, but it's also something that will should cause the program to stop immediately. If you want to hide all of the debug messages, but you want to keep all of the info, warning, and error, and critical logging messages, you can just disable the debug level and below. Or you could, say, disable the warning level messages and below. Passing critical will, in effect, disable all the logging messages. And ultimately, it's up to you whether or not you decide a message for the, a logging message is important enough to be at debug or critical or warning or whatever. Now, instead of displaying the log messages to the screen, you can also write them to a text file. If you want to write all of these log messages to a file, just change this basic config call and add file name equals, and just type the file name that you want it to write to. I'm going to say myprogramlog.txt. This is a relative path name, so this will just be written to this file name in the current working directory. So now, when I run the program, instead of being displayed to the screen, all of the logging messages are saved to this file. So I'm going to run this, and none of the logging messages appeared on the screen. But if I open up the file explorer, I'll see that my program log.txt has been created, and that has all of the log messages I need. To recap, the logging module lets you display logging messages. The log messages create a breadcrumb trail of what your program is doing. After calling basic config to set up logging, call logging.debug to create a log message. And when you're done, you can disable the log messages by calling logging.disable and passing logging.critical to it. So don't use print for log messages. They're really hard to remove when you're done debugging. The five log levels are debug, the lowest, Info, Warning, Error, and Critical. You can also log to a file instead of the screen with the file name keyword argument to the basic config function. Welcome to Lesson 37, which roughly covers pages 225 to 231 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. The debugger is a feature of idle that allows you to execute your program one line at a time. The debugger will run a single line of code and then wait for you to tell it to continue. So by running your program under the debugger like this, you can take as much time as you want to examine the values and the variables at any given point during the program's lifetime. This is a really valuable tool for tracking down bugs. To enable idle's debugger, click on Debug and Debugger. This will bring up the debug control window. Be sure to select all four Stack, Locals, Source, and Globals checkboxes. This way the window shows the full set of debug information. Let's take a look at this simple program that adds three numbers that we type in. But it has a bug in it. First I'll run without the debugger. So I'll just close this debug control window to disable the, dis the debugger. And I'll press F5 to run this program. So it asks us to enter three numbers, and then it'll print out the sum of those numbers. So I'll just type in uh, 2, 5, and 3, and it prints out the sum is 253. Now, I'm no mathematician, but that doesn't look right. Our program hasn't crashed or anything, there's been no exception that's been raised, but this is obviously not correct. There's a bug somewhere in our program, and we can use the debugger to help us track it down. So let's go ahead and enable the debugger again by clicking on Debug Debugger. And let's run this program one more time, this time with the debugger enabled. When you first run it, you'll notice that the execution will pause on the very first line and also highlight this inside the file editor window. You can also tell right here that the, that the debugger has paused on line one. So this means that the execution is about to execute this line of code. It just hasn't yet. Also, the debugger will show you a list of all the local variables and all the global variables and their values. You'll notice that in this list there's a bunch of variables that you haven't defined, such as uh, double underscore built-ins, also called dunder built-ins. There's also dunder doc, dunder file, dunder loader. These are variables that Python automatically sets whenever it runs any program. Uh, the meaning of these variables is beyond the scope of this book, so you can comfortably ignore them. Now go ahead and click the over button once. This is the step over button. So that will execute 
the line of code that was highlighted and then and then proceed to pause again before it executes the next line. You can see that the debugger is now has the execution on line two and it's paused right there. You can see that this print function call right here has been printed to the interactive shell. We can go ahead and click on over again and that will execute this function call to input. So now our program has called input and it's waiting for us to type something in. So I'm just gonna type two and press enter. And so then it proceeds to the next line where the, where the debugger will pause it one more time. So you can see how this step over button allows us to execute a single line of code at a time in our program. So I'm just gonna click over again. It'll execute that print function call and print out enter the second number and then I'll print over again so that we can enter the second number from this input call. We can see now we're on line five right here. It's also highlighted in the file editor. I'll just keep clicking over. And I'll type in three there. And notice as I type in those numbers and they get assigned to these variables first, second, and third, those variables show up inside the global section because they're global variables. So we can actually see the first, second, and third variables along with the values that we've typed in. So if we look at this, we can kind of figure out, oh, okay, so these values are actually strings, which makes sense because then you can remember that input will return a string value, even if you type in a number such as two, five, or three. So what's happening in our program, the bug is actually because we're doing string concatenation with these three variables instead of mathematical addition. So they're not being added together, they're just being concatenated together because they're string values and we totally forgot to convert these to integers before storing them in first, second, and third. So we can just keep clicking over and once the program terminates, the debugging will also stop. Now we've used the over button, but there are also five different buttons here. The go button will just run the program normally. It sort of disables the debugger for the rest of the program and it keeps running until it either reaches the end of the program or a breakpoint. And we'll explain breakpoints later. The step button, or step into, will actually move the debugger inside of a function call, if that's what's about to be executed. And step out will just keep executing lines until the function that you're currently in returns. I'll go over the step uh, into and step out buttons in a moment. And the quit button just terminates your program immediately. It just shuts off the program. Uh, so if you don't want to run the program anymore, you can just click on quit. Now let's take a look at that step into and step out buttons. Here we have a program that just has two of these functions. One is blah, 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 which just prints blah a lot and then calls the other function more blah, which just prints blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna disable the debugger by closing this. I'll just press F5 to run this. So you can see it just prints out blah a lot. So let's run this program underneath the debugger. So I'm going to enable the debugger and then run this program. So you can see as before, it started the program and it's paused right before executing the first line. And so this is just a def statement. It's defining the function. It's not actually running the code in the function. So when I click on over, the next line of code that Python runs is actually this line, which is yet another define function statement. So I'm just gonna click over there. And now we have a function call for blah, blah, blah. Now, if I click over here, the debugger is going to step over this function. Now, Python will still execute all the code inside this function call. It's just that the debugger won't pause on any of that code. Instead, it just waits until the execution returns from this function um, and then just continues down. That's what step over means. It means it doesn't go into the function calls. Whereas step into will actually follow along with the Python execution when it goes into the function call. So we can see here the execution has moved inside this function and also the debugger has paused. And from here we can just keep clicking over, over, over. You can see right here is a function call for more blah but if we, and it runs this code so the execution will go inside here and then go to the next line and next line and then return. But if we don't actually want to follow the, uh, the execution there we can just click on over and so you can see it went from line five to line six right here. It just, it's still executed 
all of that code inside more blah, it just didn't pause the deb uh, the debugger just didn't pause when it was going through that code. So we can click over, 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 and let's say we actually do want to examine what the execution is doing when it goes inside there. We can click on step into again, and now we follow the execution as it's going inside this function. So I can click on over right here, and then let's say there was a lot of code inside this more blah function, and we just wanted the, the debugger to keep executing code at normal fast speed, and then pause once it got outside of this more blah function call. We could click on the step out button, and that's exactly what it would do. It executes the rest of the function in that code, and then pauses once the execution has returned from this function. It's stepped outside of this function. Now print is also a function call. It's a function that comes with Python, and you can always assume that if you have a bug in your program, it's not because of Python's own built-in functions. Those have already been well debugged by the the maintainers of Python, so you don't really have to ever step into these. But if you accidentally do step into, say, the print function, it'll usually bring up this brand new file, and this is actually idle's own code. But you'll look at this and think like, oh, I have no idea what's going here. Don't panic if you ever accidentally do that. Just click on step out, and you'll immediately keep executing the rest of this code until you step out of it, and then you can just close this, that giant file editor window that appeared. And now let's say I don't want to execute, I don't want the debugger to follow the rest of the blah 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 code, I can just click on out. That will just execute the rest of this code in the function and then return here, but it doesn't pause because uh, there's no more lines of code after the blah 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 function call. So you can see here the program has terminated. Now stepping through the program with the debugger is helpful, but it can also be really slow if you have lots of lines of code that you need to step over. Often you'll want a program to run normally until it reaches a certain line of code in your program where you think the bug in your program is happening. Now you can configure the debugger to do this with breakpoints. A breakpoint can be set on a specific line of code and forces the debugger to pause whenever the program execution reaches that line. So here we have a simple uh, coin flip simulator. It simulates a thousand coin flips. Uh, at the very beginning we just have the heads variable set to zero. And then this for loop will loop a thousand times, with i being set uh, to 1 all the way up to, but not including a thousand and one. And here's the part that actually simulates the coin flip. We just get a random integer between 0 and 1. And since that's just two integers, they both have a 50-50 chance of happening. And so if this random integer is equal to 1, we'll consider that a head. So we'll just increment the heads variable by 1. And then halfway through this loop, when i is equal to 500, we'll just have a little if statement run this code that just tells us, oh, halfway done. And then at the very end of the program, after this loop, we just print out how many times heads came up. So first I'm going to run this without the debugger, so I'll close the debugger window, and I'll just press F5. And so, wow, that was pretty quick, and uh, heads came up exactly 500 times. It doesn't take long at all for Python to simulate a thousand coin flips. We can run this again. Now we can see heads came up 511 times. Now heads came up 492 times. So let's enable the debugger again. And then just start running this program. So you can see the debugger has paused on the first line, so we can keep clicking on over. And you can see now that you can see that the i variable is now set to 1 and heads is set to 0. And we can just keep clicking over. Executing one line at a time each time we click on over. So say we wanted to debug the code that was inside this if block, and this only happens when i is equal to 500. So we'd have to first keep going until i equals 500, but that would take a lot of clicking of the over button. Instead, let's just go to the file editor and then right click on that line and select set breakpoint. That'll add this yellow highlighting telling us that there's a breakpoint on this line. Now we can click on the go button and Python will execute 
the rest of the code at full normal speed and only pause once it hits the breakpoint. And if there are no breakpoints, then it just continues with the rest of the program as normal. So let's click on go. You can see now it's instantly gone through 500 of those iterations of this loop. We can tell because i is now equal to 500. We can check on heads. Oh, that's 266. That's about right. And that saved us a lot of clicking over. So if you ever want the debugger to just keep going at full speed and only pause on particular lines, go ahead and just right click and select set breakpoint on that line. And then once you're done, you can just right click again and select clear breakpoint and that'll get rid of the breakpoint on that line. And here I'll just click go to finish the rest of that program. To recap, the debugger is a tool that lets you execute Python code one line at a time and it shows you what the values are in the variables. To enable the debugger, you want to click on the debug debugger menu item, and this will open up the debug control window. You want to do this before running your program. The over button will step over the current line of code and pause on the next one. The step button will step into a function call and pause on the first line of code inside that function. The out button will step out of the current function you're in. And the go button will continue the program at normal full speed and only pause on the next breakpoint or at the end of the program. And the quit button will immediately terminate the program. And you can also set a breakpoint in your program by right clicking on the file editor window and selecting set breakpoint. Welcome to lesson 37, which roughly covers pages 225 to 231 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. The debugger is a feature of idle that allows you to execute your program one line at a time. The debugger will run a single line of code and then wait for you to tell it to continue. So by running your program under the debugger like this, you can take as much time as you want to examine the values and the variables at any given point during the program's lifetime. And this is a really valuable tool for tracking down bugs. To enable idle's debugger, click on debug and debugger. This will bring up the debug control window. Be sure to select all four stack, locals, source and globals checkboxes. This way the window shows the full set of debug information. Let's take a look at this simple program that adds three numbers that we type in. But it has a bug in it. First I'll run without the debugger. So I'll just close this debug control window to disable the, dis the debugger. And I'll press F5 to run this program. So it asks us to enter three numbers and then it'll print out the sum of those numbers. So I'll just type in uh, 2, 5, and 3, and it prints out the sum is 253. Now, I'm no mathematician, but that doesn't look right. Our program hasn't crashed or anything. There's been no exception that's been raised, but this is obviously not correct. There's a bug somewhere in our program, and we can use the debugger to help us track it down. So let's go ahead and enable the debugger again by clicking on debug debugger. And let's run this program one more time, this time with the debugger enabled. When you first run it, you'll notice that the execution will pause on the very first line and also highlight this inside the file editor window. You can also tell right here that the, that the debugger has paused on line one. So this means that the execution is about to execute this line of code. It just hasn't yet. Also, the debugger will show you a list of all the local variables and all the global variables and their values. You'll notice that in this list there's a bunch of variables that you haven't defined, such as uh, double underscore built-ins, also called dunder built-ins. There's also dunder doc, dunder file, dunder loader. These are variables that Python automatically sets whenever it runs any program. Uh, the meaning of these variables is beyond the scope of this book, so you can comfortably ignore them. Now go ahead and click the over button once. This is the step over button. So that will execute the line of code that was highlighted and then, and then proceed to pause again before it executes the next line. You can see that the debugger is now has the execution on line two and it's paused right there. You can see that this print function call right here has been printed to the interactive shell. We can go ahead and click on over again and that will execute this function call to input. So now our program has 
called input and it's waiting for us to type something in. So I'm just going to type 2 and press enter. And so then it proceeds to the next line where the, where the debugger will pause it one more time. So you can see how this step over button allows us to execute a single line of code at a time in our program. So I'm just going to click over again. It'll execute that print function call and print out enter the second number. And then I'll print over again so that we can enter the second number from this input call. We can see now we're on line five right here. It's also highlighted in the file editor. I'll just keep clicking over. And I'll type in three there. And notice as I type in those numbers and they get assigned to these variables first, second, and third, those variables show up inside the global section because they're global variables. So we can actually see the first, second, and third variables along with the values that we've typed in. So if we look at this, we can kind of figure out, oh, okay, so these values are actually strings, which makes sense because then you can remember that input will return a string value, even if you type in a number such as two, five, or three. So what's happening in our program, the bug is actually because we're doing string concatenation with these three variables instead of mathematical addition. So they're not being added together, they're just being concatenated together because they're string values and we totally forgot to convert these to integers before storing them in first, second, and third. So we can just keep clicking over and once the program terminates, the debugging will also stop. Now we've used the over button, but there are also five different buttons here. The go button will just run the program normally. It sort of disables the debugger for the rest of the program and it keeps running until it either reaches the end of the program or a breakpoint, and we'll explain breakpoints later. The step button, or step into, will actually move the debugger inside of a function call if that's what's about to be executed. And step out will just keep executing lines until the function that you're currently in returns. I'll go over the step uh, into and step out buttons in a moment. And the quit button just terminates your program immediately. It just shuts off the program. Uh, so if you don't want to run the program anymore, you can just click on quit. Now let's take a look at that step into and step out buttons. Here we have a program that just has two of these functions. One is blah blah blah, which just prints blah a lot, and then calls the other function more blah, which just prints blah blah blah. I'm going to disable the debugger by closing this. I'll just press F5 to run this. So you can see it just prints out blah a lot. So let's run this program underneath the debugger. So I'm going to enable the debugger and then run this program. So you can see as before, it started the program and it's paused right before executing the first line. And so this is just a def statement. It's defining the function. It's not actually running the code in the function. So when I click on over, the next line of code that Python runs is actually this line, which is yet another define function statement. So I'm just going to click over there. And now we have a function call for blah, blah, blah. Now if I click over here, the debugger is going to step over this function. Now Python will still execute all the code inside this function call. It's just that the debugger won't pause on any of that code. Instead, it just waits until the execution returns from this function. Um, and then just continues down. That's what step over means. It means it doesn't go into the function calls. Whereas step into will actually follow along with the Python execution when it goes into the function call. So we can see here the execution has moved inside this function and also the debugger has paused. And from here we can just keep clicking over, over, over. You can see right here is a function call for more blah. But if we, and it runs this code, so the execution will go inside here and then go to the next line and next line and then return. But if we don't actually want to follow the, uh, the execution there, we can just click on over. And so you can see it went from line five to line six right here. It just, it still executed all of that code inside more blah. It just didn't pause the, deb uh, the debugger just didn't pause when it was going through that code. So we can click over, 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 and let's say we actually do want to examine what the execution is doing when it goes inside there. We can click on step into again, and now we follow the execution as it's going inside this function. So I can click on over right here, and then 
let's say there was a lot of code inside this more blah function and we just wanted the the debugger to keep executing code at normal fast speed and then pause once it got outside of this more blah function call we could click on the step out button and that's exactly what it would do it executes the rest of the function in that code and then pauses once the execution has returned from this function it's stepped outside of this function now print is also a function call it's a function that comes with python and you can always assume that if you have a bug in your program it's not because of python's own built-in functions those have already been well debugged by the the maintainers of python so you don't really have to ever step into these but if you accidentally do step into say the print function it'll usually bring up this brand new file and this is actually idle's own code but you'll look at this and think like oh i have no idea what's going here don't panic if you ever accidentally do that just click on step out and you'll immediately keep executing the rest of this code until you step out of it and then you can just close this that giant file editor window that appeared and now let's say i don't want to execute i don't want the debugger to follow the rest of the blah 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 code i can just click on out that will just execute the rest of this code in the function and then return here, but it doesn't pause because uh, there's no more lines of code after the blah 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 function call. So you can see here the program has terminated. Now stepping through the program with the debugger is helpful, but it can also be really slow if you have lots of lines of code that you need to step over. Often you'll want a program to run normally until it reaches a certain line of code in your program where you think the bug in your program is happening. Now you can configure the debugger to do this with breakpoints. A breakpoint can be set on a specific line of code and forces the debugger to pause whenever the program execution reaches that line. So here we have a simple uh, coin flip simulator. It simulates a thousand coin flips. Uh, at the very beginning we just have the heads variable set to zero and then this for loop will loop a thousand times with i being set uh, to 1 all the way up to but not including a thousand and one and here's the part that actually simulates the coin flip we just get a random integer between 0 and 1 and since that's just two integers they both have a 50 50 chance of happening and so if this random integer is equal to 1 we'll consider that a head so we'll just increment the heads variable but by 1 and then halfway through this loop when i is equal to 500 We'll just have a little if statement run this code that just tells us, oh, halfway done. And then at the very end of the program, after this loop, we just print out how many times heads came up. So first I'm gonna run this without the debugger, so I'll close the debugger window, and I'll just press F5. And so, wow, that was pretty quick, and uh, heads came up exactly 500 times. It doesn't take long at all for Python to simulate a thousand coin flips. We can run this again, now we can see heads came up 511 times. Now heads came up 492 times. So let's enable the debugger again. And then just start running this program. So you can see the debugger has paused on the first line, so we can keep clicking on over. And you can see now that You can see that the i variable is now set to 1 and heads is set to 0. And we can just keep clicking over. Executing one line at a time each time we click on over. So say we wanted to debug the code that was inside this if block. And this only happens when i is equal to 500. So we'd have to first keep going until i equals 500 but that would take a lot of clicking of the over button instead let's just go to the file editor and then right click on that line and select set breakpoint that'll add this yellow highlighting telling us that there's a breakpoint on this line now we can click on the go button and python will execute the rest of the code at full normal speed and only pause once it hits the breakpoint and if there are no breakpoints then it just continues with the rest of the program as normal. So let's click on go. You can see now it's instantly gone through 500 of those iterations of this loop. We can tell because i is now equal to 500. We can check on heads. Oh, that's 266. That's about right. 
and that saved us a lot of clicking over. So if you ever want the debugger to just keep going at full speed and only pause on particular lines, go ahead and just right click and select set breakpoint on that line. And then once you're done, you can just right click again and select clear breakpoint and that'll get rid of the breakpoint on that line. And here I'll just click go to finish the rest of that program. To recap, the debugger is a tool that lets you execute Python code one line at a time and it shows you what the values are in the variables. To enable the debugger, you want to click on the debug debugger menu item, and this will open up the debug control window. You want to do this before running your program. The over button will step over the current line of code and pause on the next one. The step button will step into a function call and pause on the first line of code inside that function. The out button will step out of the current function you're in. And the go button will continue the program at normal full speed and only pause on the next breakpoint or at the end of the program. And the quit button will immediately terminate the program. And you can also set a breakpoint in your program by right clicking on the file editor window and selecting set breakpoint. Welcome to lesson 38, which roughly covers pages 233 to 236 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the web browser module. The web browser module's open function can launch a new browser to a specified URL. So let's enter the following into the interactive shell. Uh, web browser dot open, and then pass it a string of a URL to open. About automate the boring stuff dot com. And you can see Python will launch a new browser, your operating system's default browser, whatever that's configured to, to the website that you past it. Now, this is about the only thing that the web browser module can do, this open function, but even so, the open function does make some interesting things possible. For example, it's really tedious to go to some website and then have to copy uh, by pressing Control c some address and then opening a new tab and going to maps.google.com and then having to paste this into that field and then press enter just to bring up a map of that address. Now we can take a few steps out of this process by writing a simple script that will automatically automatically launch the browser to this address on the Google Maps site. So let's start up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File. And let's see, we're going to need to import the web browser module for this, but let's think about what exactly we want this program to do. Now ideally it'd be nice on Windows if I could just hit Windows key R to bring up the run dialog and then type out map it to run the map it program. We'll just, let me just go ahead and save this as map it.py. Let's go to the my users slash al slash my Python scripts folder that we set up in a previous lesson. I'll just save this as map it.py. So it'd be nice if we could just run this program by hitting Windows key R, typing out map it, and then just pressing OK and then having, having the Python script read the contents of the clipboard and opening up a web browser to the Google Maps page at that address. Alternatively, we can also have it so that when you're typing it out right here, you could type out the address that you want and these command line arguments would be read by the map it program and it would open up the Google Maps website to this address. So that'll use the command line arguments, which we went over in a previous lesson. Remember that the command line arguments means we need to import the sys module because the command line arguments are stored in a list variable. Because the command line arguments are stored in a list in the sys.argv variable. So if I ran something like map it dot pi 870 Valencia Street. The argv variable would contain a value that looks something like this. It would have map it and then 870. It's delimited by spaces, so these command line arguments would all be separate. The next string would be Valencia and the final string would be street. So first, let's have the, our script check if command line arguments were passed. So since this is a list value, just like any other list value, 
we can call we can pass it to len the length function and if we didn't call it with any of these command line arguments the length of this list would just be one so we know that if there are command line arguments this list will have a length of greater than one so we'll just say if the length of the sys.argv list is greater than one then we know command line arguments have been passed to it so again we have this list here which is going to be inside of argv what we want to do is take these strings right here all the strings after the first one and combine them into a single string something that looks like this and if you'll remember this is exactly what the join method does for strings so we could have a string with a single space in it and called join and then pass it that list argv except we don't want this first part here we want to get a slice that is create a new list with just these values so we'll have to have the square brackets and a colon and so the slice begins at index 1 not index 0 but index 1 so we'll have this right here and we want the slice to continue to the end of the list so that means we'll just leave the second number here the second index blank so what this slice essentially equals is this list value right here so that slice is then passed to join which joins all of it into a single string value with a single space in between them so that's the string value we want for the address let's just store that in a variable named address now otherwise if there were no command line arguments then we're going to assume the user has it on the clipboard and that we should get the address from the text on the clipboard so remember, anything dealing with the clipboard, we're going to have to import the Piper Clip module. And this is a third-party module that you'll have to install separately, which we did in a previous lesson. Web Browser and Sys are modules that come with Python when you install it. So here, we just have address equals piperclip.paste. So this takes whatever text is on the clipboard and it returns it as a string, which we store into address. So by the time the program execution gets past this if else statement, no matter what, the address variable has a string of the address we want to open up. So let's go ahead and launch that web browser. We'll have to figure out what address to pass it. So we're going to look at this. Uh, let me just copy this and paste it into a comment right here. That is a huge URL. Uh, you know, this part makes sense. Okay, google.com, and then we can see, oh, here's the address. And then this looks like some latitude and longitude coordinates, and then this data part, which is really confusing. Let's just check to see if this actually works. And we can get rid of it, and hopefully the Google website is smart enough to figure out what we actually want. And it does. It actually does reroute to that same address. You know, adding all of these pluses for spaces, we could do that, but let's see if the, the Google Maps website is smart enough where if we just enter spaces directly, if it can find our address, and it does, so that's great. That means we could just paste this address right here. So the URL that we have to go to would be this part, google.com slash maps, followed by the address. We don't even have to do anything special to it. We can just concatenate this string directly to the end of that URL. So let's go ahead and I'm going to press Control C and copy that. So the website that we want to open up is going to be this website, and then concatenate the address string to the end of that. And let me go ahead and save that. So this is nice, but it's currently not very convenient to call this script because even on Windows, when I press Window key R to bring this up, in order to run this program, I'm going to have to first run Python, which is here in Program Files slash Python 3.5, uh, Python.exe, and then I'm going to have to pass it the full path of the Python script itself, which is in my Python scripts dot that, and then I'm gonna have to type in the address. But this is way too much typing. That's not really that convenient. What I want is just to be able to say map it, and then type in the address. So in a previous lesson, 
we learned how to create batch files on Windows, which would make it really easy to run a Python script. And this applies to Windows only, but in the course notes, there are steps on how to do something like this on Mac and Linux as well. So let's create a batch file that will run our mapit.py program. So I'll just create a new file. And here I'm just going to run py.exe and then pass it the path of the script. And then this percent star syntax just to pass, just to forward any command line arguments to the script. I'll make sure I set this to all files and I just save this as mapit.bat. So this is a batch file that is easier to call and the batch file will in turn call mapit.py. So now that I have that, I'm all set up. All I have to do is hit Windows key R, type map it, and then type out my address, and I can bring up a map. Or you could go to a website that has a whole bunch of business addresses on it. And a lot of these websites will have links to map websites right there, but if they don't, you could easily just highlight the address, press copy, or if somebody sent you an address in an email or something like that, just copy it, then press Windows key R, and then just type map it. And that'll instantly bring up a browser window with the address already plugged in. So while some of the programs you write will perform huge tasks that save you hours, it can be just as satisfying to use a program that conveniently saves you a few seconds each time you perform a common task, such as getting a map of an address. So to recap, Python comes with a web browser module, which has a function called open, which you can pass a string to open up a web browser. What we did in this example was create a small program that will just read an address off of the clipboard or from the command line arguments, and then open that to the Google Maps website with the address already plugged in. Welcome to Lesson 38, which roughly covers pages 233 to 236 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the web browser module. The web browser module's open function can launch a new browser to a specified URL. So let's enter the following into the interactive shell. Uh, web browser dot open, and then pass it a string of a URL to open about automate the boring stuff.com. And you can see Python will launch a new browser, your operating system's default browser, whatever that's configured to, to the website that you passed it. Now, this is about the only thing that the web browser module can do, this open function, but even so, the open function does make some interesting things possible. For example, it's really tedious to go to some website and then have to copy uh, by pressing Control c some address and then opening a new tab and going to maps.google.com and then having to paste this into that field and then press enter just to bring up a map of that address. Now we can take a few steps out of this process by writing a simple script that will automatically, automatically launch the browser to this address on the Google Maps site. So let's start up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File. And let's see, we're going to need to import the web browser module for this, but let's think about what exactly we want this program to do. Now ideally it'd be nice on Windows if I could just hit Windows key R to bring up the Run dialog and then type out Mapit to run the Mapit program. We'll just, let me just go ahead and save this as mapit.py. Uh, let's go to the my users slash al slash my python scripts folder that we set up in a previous lesson. I'll just save this as mapit.py. So it'd be nice if we could just run this program by hitting Windows key R, typing out mapit, and then just pressing OK and then having having the Python script read the contents of the clipboard and opening up a web browser to the Google Maps page at that address. Alternatively, we can also have it so that when you're typing it out right here, you could type out the address that you want and these command line arguments would be read by the Mapit program 
and it would open up the Google Maps website to this address. So that'll use the command line arguments, which we went over in a previous lesson. Remember that the command line arguments means we need to import the sys module because the command line arguments are stored in a list variable. Because the command line arguments are stored in a list in the sys.argv variable. So if I ran something like map it pi 870 Valencia Street, the argv variable would contain a value that looks something like this. It would have map it and then 870. It's delimited by spaces, so these command line arguments would all be separate. The next string would be Valencia and the final string would be street. So first, let's have the R script check if command line arguments were passed. So since this is a list value, just like any other list value, we can call we can pass it to len the length function. And if we didn't call it with any of these command line arguments, the length of this list would just be 1. So we know that if there are command line arguments, this list will have a length of greater than one. So we'll just say if the length of the sys.argv list is greater than one, then we know command line arguments have been passed to it. So again, we have this list here, which is gonna be inside of argv. What we wanna do is take these strings right here, all the strings after the first one, and combine them into a single string, something that looks like this. And if you'll remember, this is exactly what the join method does for strings. So we could have a string with a single space in it and called join, and then pass it that list, argv. Except we don't want this first part here. We want to get a slice, that is, create a new list with just these values. So we'll have to have the square brackets and a colon. And so the slice begins at index 1, not index 0 but index one, so we'll have this right here, and we want the slice to continue to the end of the list. So that means we'll just leave the second number here, the second index blank. So what this slice essentially equals is this list value right here. So that slice is then passed to join, which joins all of it into a single string value with a single space in between them. So that's the string value we want for the address. Let's just store that in a variable named address. Now otherwise, if there were no command line arguments, then we're gonna assume the user has it on the clipboard and that we should get the address from the text on the clipboard. So remember, anything dealing with the clipboard, we're gonna have to import the Piper Clip module. And this is a third party module that you'll have to install separately, which we did in a previous lesson. Web browser and sys are modules that come with Python when you install it. So here, we just have address equals piperclip.paste. So this takes whatever text is on the clipboard and it returns it as a string, which we store into address. So by the time the program execution gets past this if-else statement, no matter what, the address variable has a string of the address we want to open up. So let's go ahead and launch that web browser. We'll have to figure out what address to pass it. So we're gonna look at this uh, let me just copy this and paste it into a comment right here. That is a huge URL. Uh, you know, this part makes sense. Okay, google.com, and then we can see, oh, here's the address. And then this looks like some latitude and longitude coordinates, and then this data part, which is really confusing. Let's just check to see if this actually works and we can get rid of it, and hopefully the Google website is smart enough to figure out what we actually want. And it does, it actually does reroute to that same address. You know, adding all of these pluses for spaces, we could do that, but let's see if the, the Google Maps website is smart enough where if we just enter spaces directly, if it can find our address, and it does, so that's great. That means we could just paste this address right here. So the URL that we have to go to would be this part, google.com slash maps, followed by the address. We don't even have to do anything special to it. We can just concatenate this string directly to the end of that URL. 
So let's go ahead and I'm going to press Control C and copy that. So the website that we want to open up is going to be this website and then concatenate the address string to the end of that. And let me go ahead and save that. So this is nice, but it's currently not very convenient to call this script because even on Windows, when I press window key R to bring this up, in order to run this program, I'm going to have to first run Python, which is here in program files slash Python 3.5, uh, python.exe, and then I'm going to have to pass it the full path of the Python script itself, which is in my Python scripts dot that, and then I'm gonna have to type in the address. But this is way too much typing. That's not really that convenient. What I want is just to be able to say map it, and then type in the address. So in a previous lesson, we learned how to create batch files on Windows, which would make it really easy to run. A Python script. And this applies to Windows only, but in the course notes there are steps on how to do something like this on Mac and Linux as well. So let's create a batch file that will run our mapit.py program. So I'll just create a new file, and here I'm just going to run py.exe and then pass it the path of the script. And then this percent star syntax just to pass, just to forward any command line arguments to the script. I'll make sure I set this to all files, and I just save this as mapit.bat. So this is a batch file that is easier to call, and the batch file will in turn call mapit.py. So now that I have that, I'm all set up. All I have to do is hit Windows key R, type mapit. And then type out my address, and I can bring up a map. Or you could go to a website that has a whole bunch of business addresses on it. And a lot of these websites will have links to map websites right there. But if they don't, you could easily just highlight the address, press copy. Or if somebody sent you an address in an email or something like that, just copy it. Then press Windows key R, and then just type map it. And that'll instantly bring up a browser window with the address already plugged in. So while some of the programs you write will perform huge tasks that save you hours, it can be just as satisfying to use a program that conveniently saves you a few seconds each time you perform a common task, such as getting a map of an address. So to recap, Python comes with a web browser module, which has a function called open, which you can pass a string to open up a web browser. What we did in this example was create a small program that will just read an address off of the clipboard or from the command line arguments, and then open that to the Google Maps website with the address already plugged in. Welcome to Lesson 39, which roughly covers pages 237 to 240 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to download files from the web. The request module lets you easily download files from the web without having to worry about complicated issues such as network errors, connection problems, and data compression. Now, the request module doesn't come with Python. It's a third-party module, so you'll have to install it on your own first. The course notes and Appendix A have additional details on how to install third-party modules. Now, after installing the module, do a simple test to make sure the request module is installed uh, correctly. Try to import the request module, and if no error messages show up, then the request module has been successfully installed. To download a file, call it requests.get and pass it the, a string of the URL of the file to download. Here at automatetheboringstuff.com slash file slash rj.txt, I have a text file of the complete text of the Romeo and Juliet play by William Shakespeare. So let's go ahead and just copy this by pressing Control C and then pressing Control V to paste it into idle. And the get function returns a response object, which I'll store in a variable named res. This response object contains the response that the web server gave you for this request. You can tell that the request for the web page succeeded by checking the status code attribute of the response object. 
You may already be familiar with the 404 status code for file not found. The 200 status code means everything went okay. So if the request succeeded, the downloaded web page is stored as a string in the response object's text variable. Now this variable holds a large string of the entire play. If we pass this to len, you can see that this string has 174,000 characters in it. So let's just print out, say, the first 500 characters using a slice. Now a simpler way to check for success is to call the raise for status method on the response object. Now this will raise an exception if there was an error downloading the file and do nothing if the download succeeded. So when I call it here, nothing happens because it was just fine. But let's say I had a request.get call to a file that didn't exist. I'm just going to type some random characters here. This is a completely random, non existing file. I can then call raise for status on this response object and it will raise an exception. You can see it gives you details about what went wrong right here. It's giving us that 404 not found error. So the raise for status method is a good way to ensure that the program halts if, the, if a bad download occurs. This is a good thing. You want your program to stop as soon as some unexpected error happens. If a failed download isn't a deal breaker for your program, you can wrap the raise for status line inside of a try and accept statement to handle this error case without crashing. And from here, you can save the web page to a file on your hard drive with the standard open function. There are some slight differences though. First, you must open the file in write binary mode by passing the string wb as the second argument to open. So I'll just create a file object here and store it in play file. Call open. We'll save it to a file called romeoandjuliet.txt and open it in write binary mode by passing wb. Even if the page is in plain text, such as the Romeo and Juliet text you downloaded earlier, you need to write binary data instead of text data in order to maintain the Unicode encoding of the text. Unicode is beyond the scope of this course, but there's an excellent explanation of Python and Unicode at bit.ly slash unipane. The steps I'm showing you here work for any file that you download from the web using requests. Now, to write the web page to a file, you can use a for loop with the response object's iter content method. So I'll just say for chunk in res iter content. And the iter content method returns chunks of the content on each iteration through the loop. Each chunk is of the bytes data type, and you get to specify how many bytes each chunk will contain. Uh, let's just pass 100,000. 100,000 bytes per iteration through this loop is pretty good. So here we just call playfile.write and then write out the chunk. So each chunk is just a piece of that downloaded file in the response object. And the write method will return an integer of how many bytes it wrote to this file. So 100,000 on the first iteration through this loop, and on the second iteration, it wrote the remaining 74,000 bytes to the file. Then we can just call playfile.close. So the file romeoandjuliet.txt will now exist in the current working directory on your computer. Note that the file name on the website was rj.txt, but the file on your hard drive has a different name because we just specified a different name right here, the open function. The request module simply handles downloading the contents of web pages. Once the page is downloaded, it is simply data in your program, like any other variable. And that's all there is to the request module for doing simple downloading. You can learn about the other features in the request modules from the website request.readthedocs.org. And one last bit, the request module is good for downloading files or web pages when you have the exact URL to download. But if you have to log into a website first or figuring out the URL is a complicated process, using requests might not be the best way to do it. In the next lesson, we'll learn about Selenium, which lets your Python scripts control the web browser directly. To recap, the request module is a third party module for downloading web pages and files. Request.get returns a response object. 
the raise for status response method will raise an exception if the download failed for some reason, and you can save a downloaded file to your hard drive with calls to the iter content method. Welcome to lesson 39, which roughly covers pages 237 to 240 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to download files from the web. The request module lets you easily download files from the web without having to worry about complicated issues such as network errors, connection problems, and data compression. Now, the request module doesn't come with Python. It's a third-party module, so you'll have to install it on your own first. The course notes and Appendix A have additional details on how to install third-party modules. Now, after installing the module, do a simple test to make sure the request module is installed uh, correctly. Try to import the request module, and if no error messages show up, then the request module has been successfully installed. To download a file, call requests.get and pass it the, a string of the URL of the file to download. Here at automatetheboringstuff.com slash file slash rj.txt, I have a text file of the complete text of the Romeo and Juliet play by William Shakespeare. So let's go ahead and just copy this by pressing Control C and then pressing Control V to paste it into idle. And the get function returns a response object, which I'll store in a variable named res. This response object contains the response that the web server gave you for this request. You can tell that the request for the web page succeeded by checking the status code attribute of the response object. You may already be familiar with the 404 status code for file not found. The 200 status code means everything went okay. So if the request succeeded, the downloaded web page is stored as a string in the response object's text variable. Now this variable holds a large string of the entire play. If we pass this to len, you can see that this string has 174,000 characters in it. So let's just print out, say, the first 500 characters using a slice. Now a simpler way to check for success is to call the raise for status method on the response object. Now this will raise an exception if there was an error downloading the file and do nothing if the download succeeded. So when I call it here, nothing happens because it was just fine. But let's say I had a request.get call to a file that didn't exist. I'm just going to type some random characters here. This is a completely random, non existing file. I can then call raise for status on this response object and it will raise an exception. You can see it gives you details about what went wrong right here. It's giving us that 404 not found error. So the raise for status method is a good way to ensure that the program halts if, the, if a bad download occurs. This is a good thing. You want your program to stop as soon as some unexpected error happens. If a failed download isn't a deal breaker for your program, you can wrap the raise for status line inside of a try and accept statement to handle this error case without crashing. And from here, you can save the web page to a file on your hard drive with the standard open function. There are some slight differences though. First, you must open the file in write binary mode by passing the string wb as the second argument to open. So I'll just create a file object here and store it in play file. Call open. We'll save it to a file called romeoandjuliet.txt and open it in write binary mode by passing wb. Even if the page is in plain text, such as the Romeo and Juliet text you downloaded earlier, you need to write binary data instead of text data in order to maintain the Unicode encoding of the text. Unicode is beyond the scope of this course, but there's an excellent explanation of Python and Unicode at bit.ly slash unipane. The steps I'm showing you here work for any file that you download from the web using requests. Now, to write the web page to a file, you can use a for loop with the response object's iter content method. So I'll just say for chunk in res iter content. And the iter content method returns chunks of the content on each iteration through the loop. Each chunk is of the bytes data type, and you get to specify how many bytes each chunk will contain. Uh, let's just pass 100,000. 
100,000 bytes per iteration through this loop is pretty good. So here we just call playfile.write and then write out the chunk. So each chunk is just a piece of that downloaded file in the response object. And the write method will return an integer of how many bytes it wrote to this file. So 100,000 on the first iteration through this loop, and on the second iteration it wrote the remaining 74,000 bytes to the file. Then we can just call playfile.close. So the file romeoandjuliet.txt will now exist in the current working directory on your computer. Note that the file name on the website was rj.txt, but the file on your hard drive has a different name because we just specified a different name right here, the open function. And the request module simply handles downloading the contents of web pages. Once the page is downloaded, it is simply data in your program, like any other variable. And that's all there is to the request module for doing simple downloading. You can learn about the other features in the request modules from the website request.readthedocs.org. And one last bit, the request module is good for downloading files or web pages when you have the exact URL to download. But if you have to log into a website first or figuring out the URL is a complicated process, using requests might not be the best way to do it. In the next lesson, we'll learn about Selenium, which lets your Python scripts control the web browser directly. To recap, the request module is a third-party module for downloading web pages and files. Request.get returns a response object. The raise for status response method will raise an exception if the download failed for some reason. And you can save a downloaded file to your hard drive with calls to the iter content method. Welcome to Lesson 40, which roughly covers pages 240 to 248 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we'll learn how to write programs that pull information off of web pages. This is known as web scraping. It'll help if you know HTML and CSS selectors already. There are links to tutorials for these in the course notes, but there's also a way that you can get the browser to figure out the CSS selector for you, and we'll go over that in this lesson. When your browser downloads a web page, it's downloading a plain text file formatted as HTML. HTML sounds a bit cryptic. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Yeah, I'm guessing that didn't clarify things. Basically, HTML is the text that tells the browser how to make the web page look. You can see the HTML for any web page by pressing Ctrl U in your browser or right clicking the page and selecting View Source. HTML is mostly text with these angle bracket bracketed things called HTML elements. Bring up the developer tools in your web browser. On Chrome and Firefox, this is done by pressing F12. You can hover over the HTML in the Elements pane, and it'll point out what part of the page this HTML is responsible for. Alternatively, you can right-click on a part of the page and select Inspect Element, and that'll bring up the HTML element for that piece of the page that you clicked on. And this will be useful when we need to pull information off of a website. Now the request module handles downloading the web page itself, but that just gets us this huge string of text of the page's HTML. In order to locate the text we need inside this huge string, we need to parse the HTML. The third-party module Beautiful Soup makes this easy. And Beautiful Soup is a third-party module, so you have to install it by running pip install Beautiful Soup 4. To see if the install worked, type import bs4, and if there are no error messages, then the module has been installed successfully. Notice that even though the name of the module is Beautiful Soup, uh, the, module, the name that you use to import it is bs4. This stands for the fourth version of Beautiful Soup. So let's work through an example of web scraping the price information off of an Amazon page. So we want our Python script to download this web page and then find this price information. So I'm going to first copy this URL, and we've imported the beautiful soup module, but we'll also need to import requests, which we covered in the last lesson, and this will handle the actual downloading.
and we'll call the raise for status method just to make sure everything worked and nothing happened so that means there were no problems and no exceptions were raised by this function so that means there were no problems downloading this website and now we'll have to call the bs4 modules beautiful soup function and pass it the HTML text that we've downloaded. This will be in res.text. And this will return a beautiful soup object, so let's just save that in a variable named soup. Oh, whoops. Be sure to spell beautiful soup correctly. Now a warning will show up because there have been some additions to the beautiful soup module, and in fact it can parse HTML, but also several other different things. So if we, it'll assume that we do want to parse HTML when we call this beautiful soup function. Now this warning won't crash our program or anything. It just looks really ugly. So to hide this, we would just have to pass HTML.parser as the second argument. And this will tell beautiful soup, yes, we do want to pass, we do want to parse HTML. You could also not pass this and just simply ignore this ugly warning. So a warning is not an exception in Python. So this soup object that we have is now ready to find HTML elements in the web page that we downloaded. The main way we do this is with the select method and we pass it a string of the CSS selector for the element or elements that we want to look at. Now CSS selector syntax, if you've ever done CSS before, you've already used CSS selectors. They're kind of like regular expression syntax, but CSS selectors answer the question of how do I specify a particular part of the HTML document that I want to look at? And you could look at the HTML yourself and figure it out if you've already learned this syntax, or you can have the browser figure it out for you. So let's just right click on this price information right here and select inspect element. So this will show you that this span element is the HTML element that contains that price text, that $22.86. So to get a CSS selector for this span element, you can right click on the element and select copy CSS path. If you use browsers other than Chrome, this might be copy CSS selector or copy unique selector or something like that. But just copy it and that'll be copied to the clipboard and then we'll paste it into our code. And so this is the address of that span element that contains the price. And what select does is it returns a list of all these element objects for all the matching elements. And since this is a unique selector that we gave, there will only be one element in this list. So let's save this to a variable called elems. So elems is just a list. It'll contain one element object. So we'll just use the zero index to get that element. And each of these element objects just like the requests' uh, response objects, has a member variable called text. And text just holds a string value of the text inside that HTML, HTML element. You can see right here, it has a bunch of new lines and the price inside of this. We can see this right here. There's a bunch of tab characters and new lines and just white space characters. So that's kind of messy. Let's just, um, let's call this strip string method. We've seen that before. And this will return a new string without all of this white space characters on either side of the string. And that returns $22.86. So we've just written Python code that downloads a website and finds information for us. Let's put all of this together inside of a single program. I'm gonna click on File, New File. And let's take this from the top. So. We're going to have to import bs4 and also requests. And let's create a function called get Amazon price. And we just pass this a string of the product's URL. And this function will return the price of the product. So when we call this later on, say get Amazon price, we pass it the URL of the product we want. And this will return some price information. I'll store that in a price variable. And then we can do whatever we want with that price information. I'll just print it out to the screen. So the price is, and use string concatenation, just concatenate this and then print it out. 
So we want this function to return a string of the price. That's pretty simple. That's basically all the steps that we've done already. So let's put them all into this function. So first we use request to download that page and we'll just call raise for status. So if there was some sort of problem downloading this, it'll raise an exception in Crasser program. Next, we wanna create a soup object by calling the beautiful soup function and passing it the HTML text of that web page we've downloaded. That's, that'll be in the text variable of the response object. And then we'll call the select method. We'll just pass it this CSS selector, which we originally got just from the web page by right clicking on that price, selecting inspect element, then right clicking on the element and getting the CSS path for it. This will return a list of matching elements for that CSS selector. We only want the first one in there and that element object will also, just like how response objects happen to also have a member variable called text that contains their content. Element objects also have a variable called text, coincidentally, that contains the text inside that HTML element. And it had a lot of white space on either side of it, so let's just call the strip string method on the string inside of text. And so that'll give us that $22 string. So we want our function to just return that. So let's go ahead and test this out. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. This beautiful soup function, just to, get, just to make sure that that ugly warning message doesn't show up, we'll just pass html.parser to it. All right, so let's test this out. I'm gonna save this as example.py, and I'll press F5 to run it. And that worked. So behind the scenes of this really simple print function call that just displays this text, our program went to the Amazon website, downloaded the web page, it parsed the HTML of that web page looking for the price, and then that function returned this price, which we then just passed it along to print to print out, oh, the price of that is $22.86. Now just imagine if you had a hundred things that you needed to check the price on every day just to see if they changed or not. If you did that by hand, you would have to go through every single product on this website over and over, writing down all the prices. That would be a bit of a pain, but now we have a function that we just pass it the URLs, and we could just run this program to download all these hundreds or even thousands of product prices and just look at the prices there. So if we had hundreds or thousands of product URLs, we would just call get Amazon price for each of them and that would return the price for us. We wouldn't have to touch the web browser ourselves at all. Now, this code won't work on every Amazon page. It's very dependent on exactly how Amazon format, formats the HTML of their web pages. If they ever update their web page or even just have a different kinds of products with different kinds of product web pages, sometimes this code might fail. We'd have to figure out the new CSS selector for that new web page. So you can try adding a try and accept block to this code to gracefully handle any errors that come up, or maybe even just put a debugger breakpoint to see exactly how this failed. But even still, this code will mostly work. So now go to some other websites and try web scraping. I really recommend the National Weather Service at weather.gov or the webcomic XKCD. You could write some program that would figure out the HTML for this image right here and then use request to download this image and then start parsing for this link information to figure out the URL of the previous comic and then just repeat that and that way you can repeatedly download all of the images off of this website. So to recap, web pages are plain text files formatted as HTML and HTML can be parsed with the beautiful soup module. Beautiful soup is imported with the name BS4. You'll have import BS4 as your code. So you can pass the string with the HTML to the BS4.BeautifulSoup function to get a soup object. And the soup object has a select method that can be passed a string of the CSS selector for an HTML element. Now you can figure out the CSS selector string yourself if you know the selector string syntax. 
But an easier way to do it is just use the browser's developer tools by right-clicking an element and selecting Copy CSS Path. And the select method will return a list of matching element objects. Each of these element objects has a text variable with a string of the, HT of the element's HTML. Each element object has a text variable with a string of that element's HTML. Welcome to Lesson 40, which roughly covers pages 240 to 248 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we'll learn how to write programs that pull information off of web pages. This is known as web scraping. It'll help if you know HTML and CSS selectors already. There are links to tutorials for these in the course notes, but there's also a way that you can get the browser to figure out the CSS selector for you, and we'll go over that in this lesson. When your browser downloads a web page, it's downloading a plain text file formatted as HTML. HTML sounds a bit cryptic. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Yeah, I'm guessing that didn't clarify things. Basically, HTML is the text that tells the browser how to make the web page look. You can see the HTML for any web page by pressing Ctrl U in your browser or right clicking the page and selecting View Source. HTML is mostly text with these angle bracket bracketed things called HTML elements. Bring up the developer tools in your web browser. On Chrome and Firefox, this is done by pressing F12. You can hover over the HTML in the Elements pane, and it'll point out what part of the page this HTML is responsible for. Alternatively, you can right-click on a part of the page and select Inspect Element, and that'll bring up the HTML element for that piece of the page that you clicked on. And this will be useful when we need to pull information off of a website. Now the request module handles downloading the web page itself, but that just gets us this huge string of text of the page's HTML. In order to locate the text we need inside this huge string, we need to parse the HTML. The third-party module Beautiful Soup makes this easy. And Beautiful Soup is a third-party module, so you have to install it by running pip install Beautiful Soup 4. To see if the install worked, type import bs4, and if there are no error messages, then the module has been installed successfully. Notice that even though the name of the module is Beautiful Soup, uh, the, module, the name that you use to import it is bs4. This stands for the fourth version of Beautiful Soup. So let's work through an example of web scraping the price information off of an Amazon page. So we want our Python script to download this web page and then find this price information. So I'm going to first copy this URL, and we've imported the beautiful soup module, but we'll also need to import requests, which we covered in the last lesson, and this will handle the actual downloading. And we'll call the raise for status method just to make sure everything worked. And nothing happened, so that means there were no problems. And no exceptions were raised by this function, so that means there were no problems downloading this website. And now we'll have to call the BS4 module's beautiful soup function and pass it the HTML text that we've downloaded. This will be in res.text. And this will return a beautiful soup object, so let's just save that in a variable named soup. Oh, whoops. Be sure to spell beautiful soup correctly. Now a warning will show up because there have been some additions to the beautiful soup module, and in fact it can parse HTML but also several other different things. So if we It'll assume that we do want to parse HTML when we call this beautiful soup function. Now this warning won't crash our program or anything, it just looks really ugly. So to hide this, we would just have to pass html.parser as the second argument. And this will tell beautiful soup, yes, we do want to pass, we do want to parse HTML. You could also not pass this and just simply ignore this ugly warning. So a warning is not an exception in Python. So this soup object that we have is now ready to find HTML elements in the 
web page that we downloaded. The main way we do this is with the select method and we pass it a string of the CSS selector for the element or elements that we want to look at. Now CSS selector syntax, if you've ever done CSS before, you've already used CSS selectors. They're kind of like regular expression syntax, but CSS selectors answer the question of how do I specify a particular part of the HTML document that I want to look at. And you could look at the HTML yourself and figure it out if you've already learned this syntax, or you can have the browser figure it out for you. So let's just right click on this price information right here and select inspect element. So this will show you that this span element is the HTML element that contains that price text, that $22.86. So to get a CSS selector for this span element, you can right click on the element and select copy CSS path. If you use browsers other than Chrome, this might be copy CSS selector or copy unique selector or something like that. But just copy it and that'll be copied to the clipboard and then we'll paste it into our code. And so this is the address of that span element that contains the price. And what select does is it returns a list of all these element objects for all the matching elements. And since this is a unique selector that we gave, there will only be one element in this list. So let's save this to a variable called elms. So elms is just a list. It'll contain one element object. So we'll just use the zero index to get that element. And each of these element objects, just like the requests uh, response objects, has a member variable called text. And text just holds a string value of the text inside that HTML. HTML element. You can see right here has a bunch of new lines and the price inside of this. You can see this right here. There's a bunch of tab characters and new lines and just white space characters. So that's kind of messy. Let's just, um, let's call this strip string method. We've seen that before. And this will return a new string without all of this white space characters on either side of the string. And that returns $22.86. So we've just written Python code that downloads a website and finds information for us. Let's put all of this together inside of a single program. I'm going to click on File, New File, and let's take this from the top. So we're going to have to import VS4 and also Requests, and let's create a function called Get Amazon Price, and we just pass this a string of the product's URL. And this function will return the price of the product. So when we call this later on, say get Amazon price, we pass it the URL of the product we want. And this will return some price information. I'll store that in a price variable. And then we can do whatever we want with that price information. I'll just print it out to the screen. So the price is, and use string concatenation, just concatenate this and then print it out. So we want this function to return a string of the price. That's pretty simple. That's basically all the steps that we've done already. So let's put them all into this function. So first we use request to download that page and we'll just call raise for status. So that if there was some sort of problem downloading this, it'll raise an exception and crash our program. Next, we want to create a soup object by calling the beautiful soup function and passing it the HTML text of that web page we've downloaded. That's, that'll be in the text variable of the response object. And then we'll call the select method. We'll just pass it this CSS selector, which we originally got just from the web page by right clicking on that price, selecting inspect element then right clicking on the element and getting the CSS path for it. This will return a list of matching elements for that CSS selector. We only want the first one in there and that element object will also, just like how response objects happen to also have a member variable called text that contains their content, element objects also have a variable called text, coincidentally, that contains the text inside that HTML element and it had a lot of white space on either side of it. So let's just call the strip string method on the string inside of text. 
And so that'll give us that $22 string. So we want our function to just return that. So let's go ahead and test this out. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. This beautiful soup function, just to, get, just to make sure that that ugly warning message doesn't show up, we'll just pass html.parser to it. All right, so let's test this out. I'm gonna save this as example.py, and I'll press F5 to run it. And that worked. So behind the scenes of this really simple print function call that just displays this text, our program went to the Amazon website, downloaded the web page, it parsed the HTML of that web page looking for the price, and then that function returned this price, which we then just passed it along to print to print out, oh, the price of that is $22.86. Now just imagine if you had a hundred things that you needed to check the price on every day just to see if they changed or not. If you did that by hand, you would have to go through every single product on this website over and over, writing down all the prices. That would be a bit of a pain, but now we have a function that we just pass it the URLs, and we could just run this program to download all these hundreds or even thousands of product prices and just look at the prices there. So if we had hundreds or thousands of product URLs, we would just call get Amazon price for each of them and that would return the price for us. We wouldn't have to touch the web browser ourselves at all. Now, this code won't work on every Amazon page. It's very dependent on exactly how Amazon format, formats the HTML of their web pages. If they ever update their web page or even just have a different kinds of products with different kinds of product web pages, sometimes this code might fail. Well, you'd have to figure out the new CSS selector for that new web page. So you can try adding a try and accept block to this code to gracefully handle any errors that come up, or maybe even just put a debugger breakpoint to see exactly how this failed. But even still, this code will mostly work. So now go to some other websites and try web scraping. I really recommend the National Weather Service at weather.gov, or the webcomic XKCD. You could write some program that would figure out the HTML for this image right here, and then use request to download this image and then start parsing for this link information to figure out the URL of the previous comic and then just repeat that and that way you can repeatedly download all of the images off of this website. So to recap, web pages are plain text files formatted as HTML and HTML can be parsed with the beautiful soup module. Beautiful soup is imported with the name BS4. You'll have import BS4 as your code. So you can pass the string with the HTML to the bs4.beautifulsoup function to get a soup object. And the soup object has a select method that can be passed a string of the CSS selector for an HTML element. Now you can figure out the CSS selector string yourself if you know the selector string syntax, but an easier way to do it is just use the browser's developer tools by right-clicking an element and selecting copy CSS path. And the select method will return a list of matching element objects. Each of these element objects has a text variable with a string of the, HT of the element's HTML. Each element object has a text variable with a string of that element's HTML. Welcome to lesson 41, which roughly covers pages 256 to 261 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In the previous two lessons, you learned how to download web pages and parse their HTML. This is fine if you just need the static text from a URL, but sometimes the web pages you want to access will require you to log in or they rely on JavaScript in order to work properly. This isn't something you can easily do by just downloading a URL. The Selenium module will launch a web browser that you can programmatically control from your Python program. You can call functions that will find HTML in the browser or fill out forms and login fields and click submit buttons. But because it launches a web browser, it's a bit slower and hard to run in the background if, say, you just need to download some files from the web. Selenium is a third-party module that you can install by running pip install selenium. Consult the course notes or appendix A of the Automate book for instructions on installing it. 
For this lesson, you'll need the Firefox web browser installed. This will be the browser that you control. If you don't already have Firefox, you can download it for free from getfirefox.com. Importing the modules for Selenium is slightly tricky. Instead of import Selenium, you'll need to run from Selenium import web driver. And the exact reason why the Selenium module is set up this way is kind of beyond the scope of this lesson. Just remember that you have to import it as from Selenium import web driver. And after that, you can launch the Firefox browser with Selenium by calling the webdriver.firefox function. And this will return a browser object, which we'll store here in this variable called browser. But notice, once I run this instruction, a new Firefox window has been launched. I'll just set this off to the side. And you can now control this by calling methods on this browser object, the most basic of which is the get method, which will just send this browser to a URL. So I'll just pass it the string automate the boring stuff.com. And you can see my Python code is controlling this browser. So everything that a web browser does, Selenium is basically simulating. Now let's use CSS selectors to find an element on this page. Say I wanted to click on this link right here for the chapter zero link. I'm just going to use the trick of right clicking on it and selecting inspect element. And here I'll right click here to get a unique CSS selector by clicking on copy unique selector. So this is a selector string, just like the kind that we used in Beautiful Soup. So what I'm going to do to get this element is I will call browsers find element by CSS selector, which is kind of a long name for this method, but I'll just pass it that CSS selector. And now you can see I have an, a web element object stored in the elem variable. And so once I have this element object, which represents a single element on this web page, I can then just call its click method, and that will simulate clicking on that link, on that element, in the web browser. So if this element was a link, or if it was a checkbox, or if it was a submit button, you can simulate clicking on it. Now you can also specify, instead of a unique CSS selector, a more general CSS selector in, that will match multiple elements. And using that, we can then call the find elements plural by CSS selector. And say if I just wanted to get all of the paragraph elements from that HTML page, you can see that this method returns a list of these element objects. Here I have 109 matching paragraph elements from that page. Selenium has several different methods for getting web elements from the web page. The ones that you'll most often use are find element by CSS selector and find elements by CSS selector, but you can also find elements by class name, by ID, link text, uh, the name or the tag name. All of these methods have a singular element form that will just return the first matching element, or find elements, plural, which will return every matching element that it finds. And there's more documentation on these in the Automate book. So we know how to click on things. Let's see how we can type into a web page as well. I'm just going to click on this link right here, and here we can find a search field for the automatetheboringstuff.com website. So I'm just going to right-click on this to find its CS to find a CSS selector that matches this. So I'll just copy unique selector. So here I'll just have to get a an element for that search field by calling the find element by CSS selector. And now that I have this element object, I can then call its send keys method. And then I can pass it any string which will then be typed into that field. So if this was a search bar like this is, or if it was a username or password field, you could type in any text you want into it. So in a lot of HTML forms, I would have to find the submit button and then get an element object for that and then call its click method. But Selenium helps us out with HTML forms. I can just take this search fields form and call submit 
and Selenium will automatically find the HTML form associated with this uh, text field and then invoke its submit action. So I don't actually have to call click on anything. And you can see I've just done a search for Zophie, which is the name of my cat who features prominently in all of these chapter 17 pictures. So we've been interacting with the web pages in this browser, but using the browser objects method, you can also uh, control the browser itself. If I wanted to press the back button on the browser, I could just call the back function. Same thing with forward. Or if I wanted to hit the refresh or reload button, I could just call the refresh method. And once I'm done with everything and I want to close the browser, I can just call the quit method. And that will immediately make the browser that Selenium launched disappear. So we've seen how Selenium can be used to interact with the browser's web pages and interact with the browser itself. Let's just bring up another window. Now let's take a look at how your Python scripts can use Selenium to read the content of the web pages. First, we'll have to get an element object for the part of the web page that we want to read. Let's say, let's just grab this one right here. I'm going to inspect element, copy unique selector. Oh, whoops. And all web elements have a text member variable that contains a string of the text inside of that element. If you want the entire text for the website, the easiest thing to do is probably just grab the HTML or body element, which should contain the entire web page. If we take a look at the source by pressing Control U, you can see that the HTML element is the first element for the entire web page. So that'll contain everything in the web page. So Selenium can do much more beyond the functions described here, but this is the basics of it. Going to websites, finding elements that we want to click on, or typing text into fields and submitting forms, that's what most web browsing is. And now we have a way to write Python scripts that can do all of these actions automatically. But if you want to learn more about Selenium, you can read the full documentation at selenium-python.readthedocs.org or read the rest of chapter 11 of Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Now to recap, to import Selenium, you need to run from Selenium import WebDriver. Just running import Selenium doesn't work. And to open the browser, run webdriver.firefox. This will actually launch the Firefox web browser, and you'll see it appear on your screen. The browser's get method can be used to send it to a particular website, and the find element or find elements by CSS selector method is the main way that you'll use to grab element objects representing parts of the web page. And once you have these element objects, you can look at its text member variable to look at the HTML in that element, or you can call its click or send keys method to click or type uh, into that element. And then the submit method will simulate clicking on the submit button for an HTML form. And the browser itself can be co controlled with the back, forward, refresh, and quit methods. These will simulate the back, forward, and refresh buttons, and also closing the browser. Welcome to Lesson 41, which roughly covers pages 256 to 261 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In the previous two lessons, you learned how to download web pages and parse their HTML. This is fine if you just need the static text from a URL, but sometimes the web pages you want to access will require you to log in, or they rely on JavaScript in order to work properly. This isn't something you can easily do by just downloading a URL. The Selenium module will launch a web browser that you can programmatically control from your Python program. 
You can call functions that will find HTML in the browser or fill out forms and login fields and click submit buttons. But because it launches a web browser, it's a bit slower and hard to run in the background if, say, you just need to download some files from the web. Selenium is a third-party module that you can install by running pip install selenium. Consult the course notes or appendix A of the Automate book for instructions on installing it. For this lesson, you'll need the Firefox web browser installed. This will be the browser that you control. If you don't already have Firefox, you can download it for free from getfirefox.com. Importing the modules for Selenium is slightly tricky. Instead of import Selenium, you'll need to run from Selenium import web driver. And the exact reason why the Selenium module is set up this way is kind of beyond the scope of this lesson. Just remember that you have to import it as from Selenium import web driver. And after that, you can launch the Firefox browser with Selenium by calling the webdriver.com. Firefox function. And this will return a browser object, which we'll store here in this variable called browser. But notice, once I run this instruction, a new Firefox window has been launched. I'll just set this off to the side. And you can now control this by calling methods on this browser object, the most basic of which is the get method, which will just send this browser to a URL. So I'll just pass it the string automate the boring stuff.com. And you can see my Python code is controlling this browser. So everything that a web browser does, Selenium is basically simulating. Now let's use CSS selectors to find an element on this page. Say I wanted to click on this link right here for the chapter zero link. I'm just going to use the trick of right clicking on it and selecting inspect element. And here, I'll right click here to get a unique CSS selector by clicking on copy unique selector. So this is a selector string, just like the kind that we used in Beautiful Soup. So what I'm going to do to get this element is I will call browsers find element by CSS selector, which is kind of a long name for this method, but I'll just pass it that CSS selector. And now you can see I have an, a web element object stored in the elem variable. And so once I have this element object, which represents a single element on this web page, I can then just call its click method, and that will simulate clicking on that link, on that element, in the web browser. So if this element was a link, or if it was a checkbox, or if it was a submit button, you can simulate clicking on it. Now you can also specify instead of a unique CSS selector, a more general CSS selector in, that will match multiple elements. And using that, we can then call the find elements plural by CSS selector. And say if I just wanted to get all of the paragraph elements from that HTML page, you can see that this method returns a list of these element objects here I have 109 matching paragraph elements from that page. Selenium has several different methods for getting web elements from the web page. The ones that you'll most often use are find element by CSS selector and find elements by CSS selector, but you can also find elements by class name, by ID, link text, uh, the name or the tag name. All of these methods have a singular element form that will just return the first matching element or find elements, plural, which will return every matching element that it finds. And there's more documentation on these in the Automate book. So we know how to click on things. Let's see how we can type into a web page as well. I'm just going to click on this link right here, and here we can find a search field for the automatetheboringstuff.com website. So I'm just going to right click on this to find, its CS to find a CSS selector that matches this. So I'll just copy unique selector. So here I'll just have to get a an element for that search field by calling the find element by CSS selector. And now that I have this element object, I can then call its send keys method. 
and then I can pass it any string which will then be typed into that field. So if this was a search bar like this is, or if it was a username or a password field, you could type in any text you want into it. So in a lot of HTML forms, I would have to find the submit button and then get an element object for that and then call its click method. But Selenium helps us out with HTML forms. I can just take this search fields form and call submit and Selenium will automatically find the HTML form associated with this uh, text field and then invoke its submit action. So I don't actually have to call click on anything. And you can see I've just done a search for Zophie, which is the name of my cat who features prominently in all of these chapter 17 pictures. So we've been interacting with the web pages in this browser, but using the browser objects method, you can also uh, control the browser itself. If I wanted to press the back button on the browser, I could just call the back function. Same thing with forward. Or if I wanted to hit the refresh or reload button, I could just call the refresh method. And once I'm done with everything and I want to close the browser, I can just call the quit method and that will immediately make the browser that Selenium launched disappear. So we've seen how Selenium can be used to interact with the browser's web pages and interact with the browser itself. Let's just bring up another window. Now let's take a look at how your Python scripts can use Selenium to read the content of the web pages. First, we'll have to get an element object for the part of the web page that we want to read. Let's say, let's just grab this one right here. I'm going to inspect element, copy unique selector. Oh, whoops. And all web elements have a text member variable that contains a string of the text inside of that element. If you want the entire text for the website, the easiest thing to do is probably just grab the HTML or body element, which should contain the entire web page. If we take a look at the source by pressing Control U, you can see that the HTML element is the first element for the entire web page. So that'll contain everything in the web page. So Selenium can do much more beyond the functions described here, but this is the basics of it. Going to websites, finding elements that we want to click on, or typing text into fields and submitting forms, that's what most web browsing is. And now we have a way to write Python scripts that can do all of these actions automatically. But if you want to learn more about Selenium, you can read the full documentation at selenium-python.readthedocs.org or read the rest of chapter 11 of Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Now to recap, to import Selenium, you need to run from Selenium import WebDriver. Just running import Selenium doesn't work. And to open the browser, run webdriver.firefox. This will actually launch the Firefox web browser, and you'll see it appear on your screen. The browser's get method can be used to send it to a particular website, and the find element or find elements by CSS selector method is the main way that you'll use to grab element objects representing parts of the web page. And once you have these element objects, you can look at its text member variable to look at the HTML in that element, or you can call its click or send keys method to click or type uh, into that element. And then the submit method will simulate clicking on the submit button for an HTML form. And the browser itself can be co controlled with the back, forward, refresh, and quit methods. These will simulate the back, forward, and refresh buttons, and also closing the browser.